Now we're going to move on to a study session. We're going to receive an update on COVID-19 response efforts and preliminary financial impacts. And I believe on that, we will be switching to Javon and or uh, Keith Martini, so city manager and finance director. Please go ahead. Good afternoon to the mayor and the city council, uh, Javon Grogan, uh, the city manager. Uh, I'm here uh, in the uh, council chamber um, and I, I'll be joined by Keith Martini, uh, who will assist me in this presentation. Uh, and we also have uh, Roseanne Frost, who is the president and CEO of SAMCEDA, the San Mateo County Economic Development Association. Uh, and so at, at a point in this presentation, uh, I will turn over the screen to her and she will provide the city council and the public uh, with a uh, presentation. And so uh, right now I will share uh, our screen. Work on the technology. And one second, we'll get it up full screen for you. All right, we should be good to go. Okay, uh, so um, the objective. So uh, the objective is to give the uh, public and the community an update uh, on not only COVID-19, uh, but on the implications that COVID-19 is having on the city's budget. Uh, I think we all know uh, as we watch uh, local and regional news is that uh, we're dealing with two uh, issues, the, the very significant public health crisis uh, and the economic downturn uh, that we are in uh, that is having effects globally, nationally, and certainly here on our city. And so uh, in this presentation, uh, we will provide the city council and the public with uh, an overview of uh, what the revenue projection looks like for both this fiscal year um, uh, and some of the uh, challenges that we have ahead of us for next fiscal year. And so uh, why don't we launch into the presentation? Uh, and so for our agenda, we'll give an, o an overview of COVID-19. We'll talk about um, uh, some of the steps uh, taken to limit the exposure. Uh, we'll talk about economic trends. Uh, we will talk about the current budget uh, for uh, those that at home that aren't used to government speak. Uh, we'll talk a lot about fiscal year 1920. That is our current budget year, uh, which goes from July 1, 2019 through June 30, 2020. And the next fiscal year that we are in the process of developing um, that uh, will go before the city council uh, in May and in June and will take effect for July 1 of 2020 uh, and run through uh, June 30th, 2021. Uh, we'll talk about next steps um, uh, because this tonight is a presentation of the analysis. Uh, and then uh, the next steps will be strategies to address. So why don't we be, begin with our update of COVID-19. Uh, so in our county, um, San Mateo County, we know that uh, as of today, there are 721 uh, confirmed COVID-19 cases. And unfortunately, there uh, have been 21 deaths. Uh, the best resource for the community, um, as we have pushed out on various platforms, is uh, on health information, is the San Mateo County Health Officers website. That is up on the screen. It is smchealth.org slash coronavirus, uh, and uh, we'll be showing you images from that page uh, in a little bit. And so as we all know that uh, we have a shelter in place order um, that uh, began on, uh, took effect on March 17th. Uh, it is currently in effect through May 3rd. Um, that has not been extended, uh, but may be extended. And uh, we are uh, waiting on the health officer uh, for additional guidance. Uh, I think we all know that uh, schools uh, have not been canceled uh, for this uh, for this school year, uh, but all in-school sessions have been canceled. Uh, and on Monday, it was announced that um, that applies to all private and parochial schools as well. Uh, and essential businesses, as we all know, are open with social distance uh, with social distancing uh, protocols. So uh, a couple stats. Uh, so this page is a, is a screenshot from the county, uh, and I, we'll go really quickly through some of the details on subsequent pages. But uh, cases uh, per day, as we've talked a lot about, all of these strategies are about lowering uh, the curve. Uh, and uh, this data shows clearly a bell curve. Um, and what it clearly shows is that uh, it appears to be moderating, and we appear to be approaching the peak. 
Uh, there's no confirmation that we're at the peak now, but you see that bell curve is starting to have a nice uh, uh, bell curve uh, shape to it. And we always knew that um, everything we're doing is not to um, stop the virus. Uh, it is to slow its impact on our community. Uh, and we want to reduce the number of infections uh, by social distancing and also allow our hospitals with the uh, capacity to address those that are sick. Uh, new cases by day uh, is another way to uh, see the information. And what you can see is that um, as we have continued our social distancing, which began, uh, as I mentioned, on March 17th, um, there was a spike in the number of daily cases. Uh, but over the last few weeks, there's been a decrease in the number of daily cases, a significant decrease uh, from what we saw at the uh, end of March and the beginning of April. And so we should all be proud of that. Um, we should all be proud of all the social distancing that uh, not just uh, our community, but everywhere else in the county has employed. Uh, a little bit more detail on the total cases. So uh, as we all know, there is no uh, age range that is not hit by COVID-19. Uh, and we see that certainly in our county data, uh, which is the chart that uh, is before you on the left-hand side, where you can see that the age range for those positive cases goes from zero uh, uh, to above 90. Uh, with the largest single group uh, of positive cases in the 31 to 50 range, um, uh, and you know, fairly equally split between female and male, uh, uh, 390 female and 331 male. However, the story is different when we look at deaths. Uh, we know that um, uh, uh, unfortunate um, deaths from COVID-19 of uh, uh, more affect our um, uh, 51 to older population uh, that's been reported nationally and we certainly see that trend uh, uh, within our local county. There has been no one under 50 that has died within our county um, from COVID-19, but it is those uh, in our older population that we are most concerned about. Uh, and that's why we all have to employ social distancing because we may be carriers uh, and we may be infecting someone else in our community and may not know. And I just wanted to provide this statistic uh, and uh, representation. And this is all public data and again, available on the county website. Uh, next is a little bit of a good news, good news story, um, which is our hospital capacity. Uh, we've been seeing nationally uh, the ability to acquire ventilators and beds. Uh, and so this county uh, has done an amazing job and I think we should all be proud of that. And so this is a, um, a page on their website and I wanna provide a little bit more detail. So what's before you on this slide, um, is a representation of beds, available hospital beds and ventilators. So in our county, um, uh, right now we have um, about 100 beds uh, in use uh, related to COVID-19, um, but we have more available beds than we have uh, in use. And so uh, we know that uh, we appear to, one, have uh, flattened our curve, uh, but we also appear to have uh, enough hospital beds available uh, for when we hit the surge. Uh, and the same thing is true on ventilators. Uh, we have enough ventilators available, uh, about uh, uh, a little bit over 50 in use, uh, but another uh, 160 to 167 uh, over the last few days available to be used. And so that's good news of, uh, of where our county sits. And so that's most important for our residents at home that may be watching national news, in particular in New York, uh, and may be fearing if they get sick, uh, will, our, will the hospital system be able to accommodate them? Locally, uh, we have the available beds and ventilators. Uh, and this is uh, on lab testing. Uh, the only uh, reason why, I, there's a lot of data here, but uh, I'm, I'm just highlighting positivity uh, because out of the total tests that have been done in our county, uh, over 6,700 6, tests, the positive rate is about 10%. Um, that shouldn't alarm people because most of the time people that get the test uh, have symptoms of being sick. And so it's not surprising that uh, the positivity rate is higher than the 3% that uh, we expect uh, of the population that may get COVID-19. Uh, but of those that have been tested in our county, uh, the positivity rate is 10%. Um, and so um, as I think everybody knows, there's a, a wonderful collaboration going on between the uh, the, our city, the county, uh, the county health department, and the CDC. Uh, the elected officials countywide uh, are briefed three times a week. Uh, and then there's a city manager briefing uh, with all the city managers in the county three times a week. Uh, there's testing available uh, to the public at the San Mateo County Event Center. 
uh, through the Verily website, verily.com. Uh, you, if you are having symptoms, uh, the best recommendation is to go see uh, your physician to be prioritized um, or go to the verily.com site. And members in our community uh, may have also seen the testing site that uh, Dignity Health set up uh, in town center. Uh, there are a number of temporary housing sites. One of the things that um, the, the county set up knowing that people uh, will need to be quarantined, but will not be able to be quarantined in their home, potentially not wanting to affect, infect other members of their home. Uh, there is a quarantine site at the San Mateo County Event Center uh, and uh, going through your health provider, uh, should you have to quarantine, uh, you can get access to that. Um, as we all know that there is a countywide moratorium on residential evictions uh, and there's additional homeless services uh, and resources out there uh, for uh, a number of the people in our community that are experiencing homelessness. Uh, and we are all adhering to the shelter in place and I just want to thank everybody in the community for doing that. Uh, and our PIL team is doing an amazing job and we'll uh, show a little bit about that. Uh, homelessness, homelessness, homelessness. Uh, I, I say that three times because we're we're getting a number of uh, members of the community um, that are experiencing increased conditions uh, with homelessness um, uh, in our city. And so uh, I, I wanna pause for a minute to talk a little bit about that. Um, assisting individuals experiencing homelessness uh, during this time um, is even more important. And I think all of our collective resolve to uh, help out people that are homeless uh, has been heightened by this public health crisis um, that we're dealing with. Um, I think one of the, the hard truths um, is that uh, people that are experiencing homelessness do not always accept shelter uh, when it is provided. Uh, and uh, we had a public comment uh, at this meeting asking has uh, the homeless encampments in our city um, been approached and offered services? The answer to that is absolutely. Uh, uh, our homeless, uh, uh, coordinator, uh, outreach coordinator life moves continues to serve as well as uh, our staff that go out and um, uh, interface with our homeless population. Uh, they have been offered services. Those services are not always uh, accepted. The reasons are many um, for why they may not be accepted. Uh, and I think one of the sad things is COVID-19 didn't change that. And in some uh, respects, it may have even made it worse for some individuals that uh, were resistant to services to continue to be resistant to services. And we've all uh, have heard about the increased shelter beds um, and, and hotel room beds, but they're not always taken advantage of. Um, and one of the reasons why the order was titled sheltered in, shelter in place and not shelter at home was a reflection of not everyone has a home. Um, and then the city is aware, however, that um, there are parts of the community facing additional impacts from homelessness. Uh, this is largely because the, the CDC, the D Center for Disease Control and Prevention, as well as the county, um, have um, asked cities not to move homeless encampments. And they've done that uh, in the interest of public health. The CDC has actually published interim guidelines um, asking communities not to remove homeless encampments, uh, but instead uh, keep them in place um, due to the removal will likely uh, create two things. One, uh, it creates a larger interface of uh, people that need to uh, support that removal. It also disperses um, a person's residence and, and uh, uh, potentially spreads the virus uh, to other parts of our community. Um, one of the things I wanna say from the city is while we are not um, moving homeless encampments unless there is a, a significant um, uh, criminal reason or significant risk to public health, uh, we recognize that during this time where uh, our homeless population is sheltering in place, uh, we have to continue to uh, remove some of the accumulated debris and we have stepped up our efforts in that, fa uh, in that fashion and uh, have approached homeless encampments uh, to do just that. Uh, and have them separate uh, trash from belongings. Uh, it is uh, a difficult process, uh, but it's a, it is a process that our employees are committed to, uh, and we will continue to um, address the quality of life implications of homelessness uh, as we're um, in the middle of this shelter in place order. Uh, SMC uh, Strong, um, we, we've talked about that, that has been pushed out a lot on social media. Uh, just wanted to re remind the community of that. 
Uh, there has been significant donations to SMC Strong. Uh, and the point is to help individuals and families and small businesses and nonprofits that are most impacted uh, by the shelter um, uh, in place order. And so uh, I think we all know that the county uh, has contributed uh, over $3 million to the effort. Uh, YouTube has contributed $50 million, I'm sorry, $50,000 to the effort, not 50 million. Um, and a number of other organizations uh, have contributed to that effort. Um, there are a number of um, activities that are not occurring, as we all know. Just have one of the graphics up um, to remind the public. No use of our uh, sports courts, no use of our picnic areas, most construction uh, outside of that that is uh, related to uh, a essential business um, uh, can be allowed with uh, some minor exceptions. Uh, most uh, group sports have been uh, canceled. Of course, sideshows uh, cannot occur and the use of our dog parks have been suspended. Uh, and at this point, all of our board and commission meetings um, since we have been in a shelter in place ordinance have, have been suspended. We will look to bring those back uh, with appropriate um, virtual platforms such as this uh, beginning in the month of May. Uh, City net services. Uh, so as, as uh, the community, we wanted to remind the community uh, that at the very last council meeting, we had a special meeting where the council approved um, funding uh, for a collaborative effort uh, to use our very own city net uh, internet services and provide uh, internet to uh, kids in need. So uh, kids in pre-K to 12, uh, we're estimating approximately 120 families can be served with our home internet. Uh, and the uh, plan is uh, there have been enough uh, donations uh, to provide that uh, free for one year. Uh, and so that program has kicked off. We've served a number of families already and just wanted to celebrate that a little bit. Uh, we put out a flyer uh, in English and Spanish, uh, and it, 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 it's a collaborative effort to fund that uh, between a number of entities, uh, the school districts, the San Bruno Community Foundation, the San Bruno Education Foundation, uh, also funded by YouTube, the Police Association, the Lions, and the Rotary Club. Uh, we will continue to leverage our social media uh, and all of those various platforms to reach the public. I just want to congratulate our PIO team for doing an amazing job with their with their graphics uh, and uh, informing the community. We, we've had lots of positive feedback and uh, would like that to, uh, and we'll continue that. Uh, story time, um, and with the new regulations uh, or with the new advisory notice that uh, face coverings be worn, we put that out as well, and that is that uh, blue graphic on the left. Uh, we've also, I uh, wanna remind the public that uh, the channel one for our own San Bruno cable uh, has really been turned into a COVID-19 educational platform. And so if you tune into that uh, for about 15 minutes, uh, you'll get a lot of resources that uh, you'll need and you'll hear a number of um, uh, uh, public service announcements from your uh, city of San Bruno. Uh, and we, we've done that. We've used social media, uh, our website, the city tilted up a website. Um, it's our web address slash coronavirus. Uh, we are also preparing a citywide mailer, uh, actually two. Uh, one, they were uh, stuffing today uh, to go out to our senior community that will have um, a number of um, resources and um, uh, mind games uh, in, in addition to um, uh, ways uh, for the seniors to contact. Um, and uh, we are continuing to provide our senior lunch program only in delivery. Uh, and the number is going up, uh, uh, which is good news. Uh, and we are also planning a citywide mailer uh, because we will not be issuing an activity guide uh, due to the cancellation of most uh, or nearly all of our recreation programs. Uh, we are transitioning that document into a citywide mailer, knowing that there is a population that we are not reaching on our social media platforms. Uh, Channel one, and then we have a number of public service announcements. Uh, since this 2020, just a reminder, the mayor did an excellent job at that, so I won't talk about that. Uh, and that concludes my COVID-19 update. I really want to turn it over now to Roseanne Frouse uh, from Sam Cita, who will provide uh, the city council with a presentation on uh, everything Sam Cita is doing to support our business community. So Roseanne, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and you have the con. And, and uh, Roseanne, is there uh, switching over to uh, your segue? Um, I wanted to thank you very much, you and your team, for, for the work that you've been doing with Sam Cita. Um, we get to be on these county calls where you offer and have from the very beginning that this happened when the county came and asked you and your team uh, and you really have been reaching out and very much providing 
information and resources and, and, and where people can get assistance or at least find the direction and where to go. So thank you very much. And thank you for spending your time to be here with us this evening. No, thank you, Mayor Medina, and thank you, members of the council, to City Manager Grogan and your city team. It's really been so great to get to know our communities in San Mateo County on a deeper level, and I really appreciate the collaboration. I appreciate the collaboration with the San Bruno Chamber and the Bay Area Entrepreneurship Center through Skyline College. Saida Stroud has been a wonderful partner, and I just want to say thank you to the city. I'm going to quickly go through slides to show you a little bit of the work that we've been doing since early March when the county tapped us to be the business community lead attached to the Emergency Operations Center. So we took our samsita.org website, which is usually talking about public policy, economic research, and just being a champion for the business community. And we pivoted very quickly to build one of the most extensive resources relating to COVID-19 that is out there. I want to assure the mayor and council and staff and community that all of the information we put up on samsita.org has been vetted. If we can't tie it back to a credible source, it doesn't get included. So we pivoted from doing general COVID information, having the links to the county, the health department, and we started to build the business continuity action plan and all the business and financial resources that are available today and we just keep building on that we also launched a business economic impact survey which is still open and we are going to keep it open as long as it's needed i'll show you numbers for the san bruno community a little bit later in the slide we also design helped with the design, the development, and the launch of the San Mateo County Strong Fund mentioned by your city manager a few moments ago, including all the COVID-19 related PSAs, the um, fact that the site has multilingual messaging, uh, targeted do donation outreach we've been working on by utilizing all of our elected officials in the county, as well as other folks that wanna help us raise money because the county put 3 million in from Measure K taxpayer dollars into the fund. The first 2 million has been deployed through the Silicon Valley Community Foundation for our core service agencies, for Samaritan House, Life Move, Shelter Network, and other core service agencies that are really on the front line of helping our residents find the rental assistance, the food assistance, and all of the things really to get through this very challenging time. And we're going to continue to raise money because the million dollars that's been set aside for small business assistance, if you think of a grant up to $10,000, that's 100 businesses across 21 different jurisdictions. We've also held multiple phone calls with uh, city and town economic development folks. Your economic development team in San Bruno has just been really helpful and very appreciative of all the information. Chambers of Commerce, our Convention and Visitors Bureau, as you can imagine, the hospitality, especially from the convention and the corporate travel has been heavily impacted. Trade associations, non nonprofits, and others. So if we move on to the next slide, Thank you very much to your city clerk for helping um, move this presentation forward. So the website is broken up into different sections and we keep breaking it up because there is just such a volume of information. So on the right hand side, you have all the current updates, anything that we put on on a daily basis pops to the top of the blocks that you see on the right. So any business and financial information, any of the city updates, we have our city and town links for our 21 different jurisdictions, so 20 cities and um, the county of San Mateo. We have the health information. We have a, a plug to encourage people to do the census. We also have Zone Haven, which actually is the 
It is a county platform that was designed for fire protection that quickly pivoted and loaded in from a geo mapping perspective, all the restaurants that are doing takeout and delivery, the medical resources, the social services. So any of the essential businesses that are open, you can click on Zone, Zone Haven and you can see what's available throughout the county. The jobs for hire, which I believe is very important to our community, um, considering that there are roughly close to 2.8 million unemployment claims filed in California in the last three weeks. So the jobs for hire section is again, resources that we have aggregated from NOVA, which is our workforce investment board for San Mateo County and Northern Santa Clara County, Onward California, which Governor Newsom had launched last week. So all the jobs through um, Onward California and they're matching people with jobs. So there's a lot of information on there. And then the links to our chambers and our educational resources, both through the County Office of Education, our school districts, as well as any free online resources that are available. We've had close to 30,000 views of our page since March 17th, when the shelter in place uh, first went into effect. So if we move to the next slide, here is, so the business economic impact survey is a simple 15 question survey. And it is designed to capture as much information on the economic impacts for our small business community. So the city of San Bruno, we've received 24 responses. Again, we appreciate you pushing this out through all your different modes of communication methods. So however you can do that, we've shared the information on the 24 businesses with the city manager and economic development team, because what we're seeing is communities are using this data to employ either city staff that might be pivoting to work on a new project related to what we're dealing with right now, or there might be volunteers in the community. The city of San Mateo actually deployed um, city staff to reach out to the businesses to answer questions. Uh, the city of Redwood City has used some of their library staff. We're gonna be on a call later this week with the county to see how we can ramp that up countywide. Take some of their 1700 folks that have volunteered through the county of San Mateo. And we wanna find out um, if there is a group of them that would be willing to participate in either uh, a, a webinar to help people navigate all the different resources that are available. We, we have 211, which is the general system, but really, how do you fill out an application? Should you fill out for an SBA loan? Have you contacted your bank? Like really to walk people through kind of the, the scary times that we're experiencing. So moving on to the next slide. Thank you very much again to your city clerk. I really appreciate your help. San Mateo County Strong Fund. City Manager Grogan mentioned the, the San Mateo County Strong Fund. It's something that the county was very adamant on when Silicon Valley Community Foundation launched its fundraising um, efforts back in mid-March and 10 counties were being supported. But we wanted our own San Mateo County focused. And so if you look on the, the right of the slide, you have the Silicon Valley Community Foundations as of April 13th, 689 unique donations totaling 255,000. On the left is the pledges that we received to date from AT&T, our Chambers of Commerce, Franklin Templeton, Gilead, Google, Heritage Bank, and then the, the list go, goes on. And so those pledges are all dollars that will be utilized in San Mateo County. But again, we, we need to keep raising money. And there are some cities that are looking at their financial situation as to whether they have unrestricted dollars that could use the, Silicon, um, the San Mateo County Strong Fund that then could be redeployed to an individual community. So that is something to consider. We have a memo that is prepared that we'll be sending to the mayor and city manager. Hopefully later this week is, is the plan. Um, we also have our 
very close to finalizing. It will go before the Board of Supervisors next Tuesday, the agreement with the San Mateo Credit Union to actually open an online portal, an application process. And San Mateo Credit Union has been a great partner in this because they have offices from Daly City in the north to East Palo Alto and to the coast side. And they will be able to quickly have someone complete the application, upload the necessary documents, uh, the back end of it, the technical piece is being built and San Mateo Credit Union is in the certification process to be an SBA lender that can handle both the idle and paycheck protection loans and they have fast tracked their 501c3 status through the state of California because the reason that the we're not using the Silicon Valley Community Foundation to distribute the business dollars is because as a 501c3, there are strict IRS rules regarding donations uh, to charitable causes. And so we have many small businesses that are not a 501c3, but we have to get the money out to them. So the credit union is the perfect intermediary and has the the ability to actually ramp this up really quickly. It's been very interesting because we have core service agencies. So those agencies that everyone is familiar with, and you can deploy money very quickly. But from a small business perspective, the SBA, uh, Small Business Administration from the federal government is very much used to uh, working in individual disaster areas. So whether it's a flood, a fire, a, a tornado, an earthquake, but when you have a countrywide pandemic as we are in right now, it's a very different scenario and it's very complex and You've got to be able to build things really from the ground up very quickly. So moving to the next slide, um, here is the, uh, okay, the, um, we were there, so we just have to go ahead, please. So we went through that um, here. So working with cities, chambers, the Convention and Visitors Bureau and other stakeholders. So uh, you see San Bruno City Council this evening, the other councils, chambers, and groups that we've spoken to. If we move on to the next slide. We're trying to get out information as fast as we can. This business continuity action plan was developed about two weeks ago. We are gonna uh, send out version three, so it's had It'll be its fourth iteration, but it's it's 3.0. And it really helps a, a small business look at itself. What is it, what has it done over the last few weeks to assess their particular situation? And then this only shows you the first page, but there's four other pages after it with links and resources from a legal and HR, a financial and a general information perspective to try to deploy as much information in one place as possible to help our businesses really get a, a level set as to their situation and then what would work for them versus what would work for another business. So that has been an interesting project and really to look at 30, 60, 90 days out. If we go to the next slide. So here's just an overview of financial assistance. We talked about the San Mateo County Strong Fund, federal assistance. I can tell you there's been a lot of frustration with people applying, applying for both the Paycheck Protection Program as well as the Economic Injur Injury Disaster Loan or EIDL loan. Uh, the, I was just on a call last night with the council in Pacifica and with their economic development folks today we have been trying to get answers to a number of questions as to how do these things interrelate to each other? Uh, what are the time frames for paycheck protection? You might not need it for the next two months, but you might need it you know, two months down the road in June and July, for example. So what are some of those issues that people are facing and why aren't they hearing back quickly? It speaks to our um, employment Development Department, our EDD at the state level. There's been a lot of questions about self-employed and independent contractors because those folks typically in the past would not have been eligible for unemployment payments, but they are, um, as it's been stated multiple times, but they're getting denied at the state level. So we're trying to unwind that bit of a problem. Then there's other programs through iBank and the California Capital Access Program and then we're tracking small business grants. So both from a financial perspective, and that's why we included the companies you see on the screen, as well as there are a number of companies, um, YouTube, 
Google that are doing and TechSoup and Salesforce and they're doing products as well as financial assistance. So we're trying to keep track of all of those programs and also put that uh, up in front of people. And I think that is my last slide, yes. So Mayor Benita, I just want to thank you and the council and Vice Mayor Salazar and City Manager Grogan. And really, it, it's um, been an honor to, to do this work on behalf of all the communities. And we're just going to keep pushing, pushing, pushing to try to get the maximum assistance for our county and our community. And thank you again. I know you've been busy during the day as well as uh, attending virtually uh, uh, council meetings. So thank you for taking your time. We appreciate it very much. Thank you. I have a, a question. Um, through the chair. So um, thank you, Ms. Faust. Can you hear me, Melissa? We can hear you. Oh, I, I was muted. I'm sorry. No, no, great. Thank you. Um, so I just want to first thank you, Ms. Faust. I've been on the county calls um, as much as I can be, and you've been really, really helpful in getting the county um, really collaborating behind its small businesses. Um, and I thank you for also addressing the difficulties that are being had right now with the loans. I've heard it on the county calls, and I'm glad it's um, we're being transparent with the public. Um, I wanted to know if there are any um, priorities that are given based on the cities. So is there an uh, allotment that is going to happen or may eventually happen to each city based on its population or based on its business, um, the number of business licenses it, it permits? Or um, are you looking at any allocation like that as far as the money that has been received and then the actual money that will be um, provided to small businesses throughout San Mateo County? Yes, Council Member Mason. So the first million dollars that was allocated by the County of San Mateo, the recommendation that will be going before the Board of Supervisors is that that, that million dollars is divided based on population. And um, so in looking at the population, because we were looking at different mechanisms uh, for dividing the money and seeing, uh, looking at Pass like transportation taxes and things that have been passed countywide and population seems to be where we have landed. And then with the additional money, it, it, that's all um, open for discussion with the Board of Supervisors, uh, trying to do a balance between all of the cities. And then again, if a city uh, is able to contribute, you know, to make sure that their businesses receive a part of it. We're, we're, we're trying to be really um, fair and transparent across the board. And also we have to do a very, after next Tuesday's Board of Supervisors meeting, we want to do a really strong marketing push and we're gonna ask every community to help us with this so that everyone is aware that the application process is open, that the application will be in multiple languages. So we really take that into consideration. Okay, and then just kind of a follow up to that. As you may or may not know, San Bruno has really struggled to revitalize its downtown. Um, and we were getting to a point where we were really seeing a lot less vacancies. We were starting to see the restaurants, you know, full again and people walking on the street. So I'm really concerned of the, about the impact that COVID-19 is going to have on our downtown. Um, so is it um, possible that one donation, two, I guess two more things is one, I know that some cities have made large contributions and you just mentioned that a, a moment ago. So I just want to be clear, will those cities be able to then come back and say that's only for our small business? Uh, community. And then um, on the other side, um, it can companies donate and say this percentage or this amount is to be reserved for this particular city. So that is going to be our recommendation to the Board of Supervisors. So if a city donates X dollars that it wants deployed in its community, that would be our recommendation. And then if a company or an individual wants to make a donation that is earmarked towards a particular community, absolutely. We feel that that is a, a way to really, one, increase the amount of donations because people want to see, um, I go to downtown San Bruno. I actually enjoy a, a holiday lunch with friends there every year that I look forward to. So I, 100% understand what you're saying. And so we want to be able for people's dollars to be deployed in their community. So yes. 
Okay, and then um, my last question around the financing is um, the it, the individual dollars that are being that are being donated from just regular people, non-business donations. Does that then go into a larger fund, and that's just dispersed evenly, or kind of on a first come first serve? How is that dispersed? So um, the the donations into the community foundation. So if we went back to the slide with the different buckets, some people have earmarked their donations for individuals and families, some for nonprofits, again, core service agencies, and some for small businesses. So those funds we want to distribute on an, uh, an equitable basis. That's, that's how we're planning. And then as the credit union reviews the applications, one of the reasons we, we are not recommending to put a timeline on actually like opening the application on such and such a date and closing it on another is to keep it on a rolling basis because then it'll give us, all of us, a better understanding of how many more dollars we need to raise to save X more number of businesses. So that's the thought process behind that. Okay, and I, I take it back. Another question around the, the money. Um, is there any, um, or just a suggestion, I don't know if this is even possible, but San Bruno, we are lucky that we have a community foundation and we also have a, a chamber of commerce that's kind of um, just getting up and running. And so would it be um, possible or is the idea being entertained that those organizations would qualify to ask for a loan from the larger foundation and then um, within San Bruno, our small businesses could then apply for those grants or those loans directly with the nonprofit organization or the Chamber of Commerce. So I think that's a fabulous idea. And I'm, I'm happy to, if we could maybe talk offline and, and have that question asked to the community foundation with their dollars, if they'd be willing to do something like that. I mean, my feeling is it, you, we should ask those questions. So absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And I, I haven't spoken with them, but if, if it's possible to streamline the process where a nonprofit foundation is able to apply for the larger uh, bucket and then, uh, and then disperse the funding within the local city that might make it easier on the small businesses. And it might be faster than each small business applying directly to the county. But I would love to talk to you more about that offline. And I do not represent the community foundation. Um, this idea just came to mind as you explained really this kind of complex system you guys have put together in the last two weeks. So thanks again. It's a lot of work. No problem. And I and I just think that with the community foundation, because I believe the San Bruno Community Foundation is a 501c3. Mm -hmm. So there there might be specific IRS. Well, there would be. So they would be able to actually be an intermediary for 501c3 like organizations, but not necessarily the small businesses. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank and, you. and that's and and thank you, Linda. Because uh, because of the 501c3, I don't think they, for example, they may have restrictions to where they cannot give to a business because they are profit profitable, but they could give and might cause to same entities. Is how I kind of yes. understood it. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Uh, other questions for Roseanne while we have her so we can let her maybe have dinner? <laughs> Anything else? All right. Well. Another question then if nobody else has questions. Um, I, I just, I spent a lot of time over the weekend on the website. That's why I'm, um, I have these questions and we have our, I see some of our um, business owner representatives are actually attending. So I want to make sure we get some of these answered. Just to, um, as far as the, U.S. Treasury Department goes and the streamlining of your application for loans. I, I, for my, I guess my own curiosity, but also for business owners, um, is if you've applied for one loan, can you also apply for the second loan? Um, is it possible to get both through the county and also through the federal government, or are they somehow intertwined? So with the federal loans, and we're trying to sort through this because there's been different messages whereby idle is for one thing paycheck protection is for 500 employees less and part of it could be forgiven and this actually came up in both the congressional town halls with congresswoman eshoo and spear and we're really trying to get clarification from the sba and the lenders are as well so we know what can work together and um, we are asking the question on the San Mateo County Strong Small Business as to if you've received 
dollars from somewhere else, but it's not going to preclude you from receiving a grant through. That's our recommendation to the Board of Supervisors. It wouldn't preclude it. What we're really trying to understand is how it works with the state. Um, because even unemployment insurance with the Paycheck Protection, if you've laid off employees, but really the Paycheck Protection Program is designed for you to keep the employees on payroll. So if they've gone on unemployment, but they come back, how does that impact it? What type of forgiveness? So I, I've written all these questions down and we're, we're kind of moving them up the food chain. Okay. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mayor Medina. Thank you, Zan. Be safe. Thank you very much for your time you, and all your work and effort. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Good night. Thank you. And then Javon, uh, city manager, we'll turn it back over to you. Uh, you're muted right now. There you go. All right. Uh, I just want to say thank you to uh, Roldan for joining and being a part of our presentation. You really worked hand in hand to help us support our business community along with the San Bruno Community Foundation. So uh, thank you uh, for being able to attend tonight. Uh, and so now I'm going to share my screen again, and we will turn it. Um, we'll keep going through our presentation. Um, and we will now go to a national um, uh, presentation on um, national economics. We're going to uh, start high, but then come down low pretty quick and talk about the unique impact uh, to the city of San Bruno. Uh, and I now want to turn it over to Keith Demartini, our finance director. Thank you very much, Javon. Good evening, honorable mayor, members of the city council. My name is Keith Demartini. I'm your finance director. And I would like to go through a series of slides that uh, speak to what is happening in the nation's economy um, in regards to uh, COVID-19 and the shelter in place orders that are in effect um, across the country. I'll then dive into what's happening across the state of California for many of the same economic indicators and a few other ones, uh, and then dive into what's happening more locally, uh, regionally within the county and then locally here in San Bruno. And the whole purpose of providing um, these slides is to really provide a, a great deal of depth and context as to what's happening in the economy so that we can understand at the staff level and at the city council how what is happening in the economy will impact um, the city's uh, revenue sources that we rely on um, for the for the great services that we provide to this community. Uh, and so I want to provide um, that context. And so I'll hit these slides fairly quickly, um, and we'll jump into what the national economic trends are to start. First, I'll provide a summary of what the federal government's response has been uh, to this pandemic. Uh, there were two um, massive stimulus packages that were approved uh, by the federal government. First was a $2 trillion uh, stimulus package called the CARES Act. And you can see a high level uh, uh, on this slide what the, the, of the bullets that were included in this um, stimulus package. And then there was a second package that was recently um, approved called the Main Street Lending Program to really support small businesses. The first bullet under the CARES Act, the Coronavirus Relief Fund for $150 billion, that is a source of funding that could potentially be used um, to support uh, municipalities in the state of California. So I wanna dive into that one in just a little bit more detail here on this slide. Uh, of the $150 billion, uh, only 10% of it, about 15 billion of it, um, will be distributed to the state of California. And that's based on the population of all of, all of the states. Uh, about 45% of it will be allocated directly to the state um, for their expenses. Um, and there is no provision that requires um, any of that funding to be distributed to cities in the state that have a population of under 500,000 people. So there is no guarantee at this time that any of that relief fund um, will come to the city of San Bruno. So we will continue to monitor that uh, and evaluate that going forward. There have been a series of grant opportunities that are available, primarily for assistance as it relates to firefighters, um, justice, and transportation grants. So we will continue to monitor those grant opportunities um, as well. We are actively working very closely with the California Department of Emergency Services, which is called Cal OES and the federal um, agency, FEMA, on making sure that we have all of the processes and paperwork in order 
to eventually receive reimbursement um, for our city's expenses as it relates to the COVID-19 pandemic. <clears throat> it is clear though, in reviewing the numbers that we will be presenting here in the coming slides, that the main impact to the city of San Bruno will not be um, our initial expenses related to our response. The, the ongoing economic um, issues from potential losses of, of revenues and variety of sources will be the most significant economic impacts that we will experience. And so I wanna make sure that we cover that in a great deal um, of detail as well going forward. So here's a, a two short um, charts here that describe the federal government impacts, um, two of many. The first uh, graph on the left is called the financial stress index. This index takes into consideration uh, credit conditions across the country, market volatility, equity valuations, and access to funding for businesses so that they can so that they can um, so that they can um, you know gain funding to actually to do more business. What you can see is the stress on the economy has has dr dramatically gone up uh, in the recent month here in March, um, pretty close to where it was during the financial crisis back in 2009. On the graph on the right, you can see the federal government's balance sheet, uh, and it actually has a spike on the far right in March. <clears throat> the balance sheet uh, change is really indicative of the federal government um, implementing monetary policy to buy government bonds and other assets in order to, to add a significant amount of uh, money into the economy. It's their attempt at stimulating um, the economy substantially. And so they have taken drastic measures in order to stimulate the economy shown on these two graphs. This, this slide here shows uh, the volatility in the stock market. Uh, this shows just two graphs of the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ. In the month of March, you can see that there was a substantial drop in both of these uh, stock market stock markets, but as you can see, it kind of rebounded very slightly. Uh, and this is data as of April 10th. So you can see just a great deal of volatility it is sort of the main takeaway on this slide. <clears throat> Moving on, uh, this, this graph represents the change in American spending patterns as it relates to debit and credit card transactions um, over the past uh, few months. As you can see, the rate of change in grocery purchases has substantially increased pretty much immediately, immediately, immediately following the shelter in place order uh, in the state of California. And then it actually has sort of come down a little bit, maybe um, implying that there was a drastic increase immediately following and some spending patterns are maybe starting to level out a little bit. A little bit. You can see a substantial decline in spending across uh, entertainment, uh, restaurants, transportation, shopping, and travel. And so it, we will be sort of monitoring this closely so that we can understand better changes in the sales tax and sort of purchasing activity going on within the city of San Bruno so that we can better project um, our sales tax and other business license tax revenue, for example, um, going forward. This graph here shows the number of layoffs for permanent employees that occurred um, over, the past, over the past year. And this graph does not show any significant change that occurred in layoffs uh, for permanent employees in the United States in the month of March. But this following graph um, actually shows um, a fairly large increase for temporary um, staff um, in the United States that, ha that experienced a layoff or furloughs during the month of March. You'll see this trend is very consistent with, with what is going on in the state of California as well. This graph here shows the United States unemployment rate over the past 90 years. And what you can see here uh, during the month of March into the early part of April, the United States unemployment rate has reached just over 17%. And that is higher than it's been since the Great Depression back in the late 1920s. And so we don't yet know if this rate will continue to increase, but again, we will monitor it. Uh, and this is a very similar rate that you'll see um, for California going forward. This graph here shows you just the last 15 years of what the, of what the change in the unemployment rate has been in the United States, again, showing 
um, the, mo the closest unemployment rate over the past 15 years being uh, the 10% that was experienced during the Great Recession um, back in 2009-2010. Uh, so moving on, speaking more about uh, labor economic trends, this graph here shows the number of unemployment insurance claims that have been filed in the United States over the past year. And as you can see, it was a fairly steady volume up until uh, the pandemic hit and the shelter in place orders took effect. And in last week alone, there were just over 6.6 .6 million unemployment insurance claims that were filed in that one week alone. <clears throat> sort of pivoting from uh, unemployment uh, economic indicators for a moment, let's now shift to changes that are occurring in um, property and real estate uh, economics. This graph here shows the mortgage rate change um, oh, for a 30 year fixed conforming loan um, over the past uh, eight years. And what it shows you recently and over the past couple of years actually, the rates have been steadily coming down and then have pretty drastically come down um, in the most recent uh, few weeks um, leading up to and including into the pandemic um, as well. Along those lines, uh, the opposite trend you can see here for folks that are wanting to refinance their, their primary loans on their residences. The number of uh, people that are wanting to do that uh, and take advantage of those low rates has drastically gone up. Um, and you can see this chart here on the right, it's substantially higher than the peak that, the United, that um, is seen in the United States economy over the past eight years. And so those, those trends may continue into the near future. So now I wanna shift into speaking about economic indicators that are specific to the state of California, given uh, the, the groundwork that we've laid in talking about some of the indicators in the United States. So the first, the first tar uh, table I'd like to present here are some high level uh, sales tax revenue projections uh, and the changes quarter over quarter in what is expected to occur in California next uh, fiscal year. This table lists the sales tax revenues that are generated in the six or seven major industries in the state, ranging from auto, uh, automobile and transportation sales to building and construction, uh, food and drug, fuel, general consumer goods, restaurants, and so on and so forth. So from the beginning of the calendar year of 2019 into the calendar year, uh, quarter one of calendar year 2020, you can see that number of many of these industries had already been experiencing a decline in sales tax revenue. But moving into quarter two of calendar year 2020, which is the quarter that we're in right now, it is, an, it is anticipated that, these, that most of these industries um, will experience a significant uh, amount of sales tax revenue decline. The highest ones being automobile and transportation, restaurants and hotels, and general consumer goods. And then the far right column shows you the percent change going into next fiscal year. So staff is, review, is reviewing this data with our sales tax consultant. And so we are, we're doing our due diligence to articulate what the revised sales tax projection will, will be for the city of San Bruno in this current fiscal year and it will likely decline into our fiscal year 2021, um, given these uh, forecast assumptions for the entire state of California. It's important to note here that we, uh, here in the city of San Bruno, do have a number of these um, uh, businesses in our, in our city for auto and transportation. We have a couple of car dealerships and we have a significant amount of retail activity in Tanfran, Town Center, um, Bay Hill, and on San Mateo Avenue and a number of restaurants. So now moving into uh, employment uh, indicators in the state of California, this graph is similar to what we saw in the United States with not really seeing a significant change in permanent layoffs um, occurring in the state of California. But what you can see is that there is a significant increase for temporary workers in the state of California. Again, similar to what was shown in the United States graph. It's interesting to see what sectors of the, uh, of the economy uh, are experiencing higher layoffs compared to others. And as you can see on this uh, graph, the most significant number of layoffs have occurred in accommodation, 
and food industries with arts, entertainment, and manufacturing um, kind of coming in far, far below what is being shown. This graph right here shows which regions of the state have experienced the highest number of layoffs. And as you can see, Southern California uh, to date has been hit the hardest. They have experienced far more layoffs, again, probably given the, uh, the, the size of their population and um, the diversity of their industries have yeah, have been actually been hit the hardest uh, with, Bay Area, with the Bay Area coming in um, after Southern California. Moving on to the Calif to California's unemployment rate, again, it's very similar to what is being experienced nationwide at around 17%, higher than what was at the Great Recession about 10 years ago. You can see the state's unemployment insurance claims. Also, this graph mirrors uh, the United States in total. Last week, there was just under a million unemployment claims filed in the state of California. Kind of thinking beyond the initial impact of the shelter in place to unemployment and um, temporary workforce that has been laid off or put on furlough, there are a number of uh, different jobs that are considered to be at risk um, for potential furlough or layoff uh, due to the shelter in place orders. And you can see on this graph that those types of jobs range from, again, in the accommodation and food industries to retail, um, arts and entertainment, uh, wholesale manufacturing. There are a number of industries that are could potentially be impacted through the shelter in place orders continuing. Moving on to California property trends. Uh, this graph shows the weekly home listings uh, throughout the state of California. And as you can see, there is a drop uh, that occurred in the winter months, which is more seasonal in nature and, is, and which is definitely expected at that time of year. But as you can see, it's substantially dropped um, coming into uh, the month of March, which is not typical um, for this time of year. This graph here shows the percent change of daily home showings for those properties that are on the market. And again, as you can see, the, the percent change week over week um, from the first week of January is substantially less. And the reason why these graphs uh, are important, why we wanted to show those this evening is that, um, and you'll see in the coming slides, that staff at this time do not anticipate a reduction in our property taxes um, at this time. But the, these indicators suggest that we will likely see a decline um, in any potential increases to, uh, to property taxes in the fiscal years to come. And so we will work to evaluate those, those changes in the upcoming budget as well. So I wanna shift now and talk about CalPERS, uh, the public employees uh, pension system that many, many municipalities across the state um, use uh, and are members of to pay pension uh, payouts for retirees. So this, uh, the, the COVID-19 pandemic and the economic losses that many, um, that many companies have experienced uh, hits CalPERS uh, pretty significantly because a, a vast majority of, the, of CalPERS's assets that are used to pay our retirees are invested very heavily um, to make up those payments. And as you can see, the losses that they, um, that they initially incurred um, were the, the greatest that they had experienced since the Great Recession back in 2008. These losses do impact municipalities in a few ways. First, uh, CalPERS is, is likely to change their um, discount rate, which is based on the average rate of return that they expect to get on their investments of approximately 7%. And when they lower their discount rate, municipalities are required to pay a higher normal amount, uh, which, which is an annual operating expense for municipalities and the, the amount of the municipality's unfunded accrued liability uh, increases as well. So let me just dive into that in a little bit more detail in the next few slides here. This graph shows the history uh, over the past uh, 20 years of what CalPERS's investment returns have been. And as you can see, for a majority of these years, all but four of them, they experienced uh, positive and fairly high returns on their investments. But as you can see in the years where, where the economy experienced a recession, CalPERS also had um, also experienced negative investment returns. This table here uh, shows what happens to the overall CalPERS investment fund when 
the investment rate of return that's targeted at 7% is not met. And so if you look at the miscellaneous plan, which uh, represents most of the city of San Bruno employees, when CalPERS has an investment return of 7% on their investments, the entire portfolio is funded at just over 73%. But when the uh, discount rate is reduced and their investment returns are, are decreased, the value of the entire portfolio drops from 73% to uh, 68% when it, when it achieves 0%, and then it goes down further. And so again, the impact of that is municipalities have to uh, contribute more to make up the difference. And that's really depicted here on this graph. Uh, this graph here shows what are the potential employer contributions into CalPERS to make up uh, the required contributions. So for the city of San Bruno, um, you know, if a 7% discount rate uh, is what is required, that's that blue line on the bottom. But when the CalPERS investment portfolio doesn't achieve a 7% rate of return, the city of San Bruno and all other municipalities across the state are required to pay more proportionately to make up that difference. In the fiscal year 1920 budget, uh, the city of San Bruno pays just over $10 million in total to CalPERS. That, that covers both our normal cost uh, per payroll and also the portion of our unfunded accrued liability. And that, that if uh, CalPERS reduces their discount rate, uh, the amount that the city of San Bruno would have to pay to CalPERS would, would increase. And that will be something that staff will evaluate and analyze and present to the city council during the upcoming fiscal year 2021 20, budget cycle. And so with that, I will turn it back over to the city manager to talk in more detail about local economic indicators um, and the impact on the current fiscal year. Thank you, Keith. Um, so, why don't we talk, uh, uh, bring it down to uh, what we are experiencing and are, are likely to experience. I think the first thing uh, is we don't know how long we'll be in this. Uh, from all the charts that uh, Keith just went through, we certainly uh, have a significant spike nationally and statewide um, uh, and stress on the economy uh, and unemployment. Um, the question is how long uh, will that last? And when we look uh, at history, uh, really the only um, thing higher was the, the Great Depression. Uh, and so we really need to uh, be very cognizant of our financial situation uh, and understand that we are in a new paradigm uh, financially. Uh, and uh, I think as, as everyone um, sort of that has listened to the news cycle over the last uh, 48 hours uh, has heard that there's a lot of work being done to study how do we return our economy to pre-COVID-19 levels. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, how is that done? Uh, and so as those plans are developed statewide uh, and uh, with our local county health officer, uh, that will impact our revenue. Uh, one of the things that we certainly know is that uh, whenever the shelter in place order is over, it will likely be over uh, before we have a vaccine that is widely available uh, and in use. Uh, and so there will likely be a slow recovery to the economy uh, and a slow progression to how people feel uh, uh, when they uh, want to go out and be in public and go to the malls and, and, and things of that nature. Uh, and so that, that uh, is all underpinning all of the analysis that uh, we and everyone else is running right now. We know that there's a significant impact on our small businesses um, our, and our non-essential businesses are closed, uh, but also a number of our essential businesses, uh, uh, some are deciding to close now uh, and some have uh, had their revenue significantly decreased even though they are essential. And our restaurants are a classic example um, of that. Uh, and so a lot of work is being done to see can restaurants uh, be open uh, with uh, very uh, limited uh, in-room dining, uh, but, but no word on that right now. Uh, and we all know our major retail centers, the city uh, is uh, in constant contact with the owners of Tan Fran and the on-site property managed, as well as uh, town center uh, uh, and doing a lot of work, uh, working with the Chamber of Commerce uh, and also uh, no hotel uh, occupancy, which is gonna significantly impact uh, what we like to refer to as TOT, transient room occupancy tax, but it's casually referred to as the hotel room tax. Uh, and we're likely to see these reductions uh, for um, some time to come. So let's talk about uh, impact on the city's budget. 
a quick overview of revenue. So uh, these slides should be fairly familiar to the city council and the public or anyone that watches our budget presentations. Uh, the first one is on our revenues. Uh, the vast majority of our revenue uh, is property tax and sales tax, property tax at 24%, sales tax at 16%. Uh, percent. Uh, um, and as the finance director mentioned, property tax likely more stable than sales tax um, and our transient occupancy tax uh, uh, but all represent a significant portion. Uh, and then when we look at expenditures, uh, more than 50% uh, of our general fund expenditures are for police and fire, protecting the community. Uh, that is not atypical uh, among other agencies uh, with the rest of the, the departments making up that. Um, and a significant amount going to our uh, community development department that supports development. Um, and our community services department, which is actually the third highest uh, that runs all of our recreation programs, senior programs and library programs as well. And so let's talk uh, a little bit of a comparison to other cities. I, I won't spend a lot of time on this slide, uh, but this slide is uh, being shown to just show how we stack up uh, in our total revenue compared to other cities. The largest sort of portion there is other revenue, which is a summary of a, a number of categories that were on the prior slide for San Bruno. But most importantly, I just want us to realize um, that every city will be impacted differently. Uh, and it really depends on uh, the relative proportion of your revenue sources. So for us here, uh, we have about 7% of our revenue that comes from uh, transient occupancy tax, our hotel room tax. Uh, but Burlingame, for example, has about 46%. Uh, and that's uh, shown by the, uh, the blue um, uh, bar. I just tried to use my... Uh, laser pointer, but we're, we're virtual, so that didn't work. Um, uh, but also sales tax, 16% uh, of our city uh, uh, revenues are sales tax. Uh, in, some, in some cities that's smaller, uh, like Millbrae, but in other cities that's larger. And so our unique impact uh, with the revenue streams that are producing are really gonna be reflective of um, our portfolio uh, of revenues. And I just wanna make that point uh, that we can't always look to what's happening in, in another city because their context uh, may very well be different and their reserves may very well be different. Uh, the next slide just shows our per capita revenue. We've seen this before, uh, but it just shows where we fall relative to um, uh, a per capita or per person comparison. And, and we know that relatively um, San Bruno uh, receives less revenue than other cities. Uh, and the reasons for that are many. Um, a number of the other cities uh, have experienced more economic development over the, the last 20 years. Uh, and have a different revenue base uh, than ours, but sort of um, in, in some of our neighboring cities and, and the other larger cities in the county, uh, we do on a per person basis uh, receive less revenue and, and that's part of our reality uh, and a reality that I think the council and the community knows that um, uh, we need to address so we can better fund services uh, in our, our facilities. The next slide here just shows a, a quick overview of our general fund for the prior year and uh, the current year. Only showing this uh, to remind uh, the public uh, and the council that uh, we have had deficits before, we have solved them before, um, and uh, we, we are entering a point where we have to be very cognizant with our revenues and, and adjust our expenditures. Uh, and the city council uh, really did an amazing job reducing the deficit this year. And that deficit of 325,000 uh, was paid for by one-time money. And so it was one-time money for one-time expenditures. And so it wasn't an ongoing budgetary deficit, but it was using some accumulated uh, fund balance that we had essentially uh, money in the city savings account to make one-time improvements. Uh, the other point of this slide is that uh, know that our general fund is 50 million in round numbers. So as we begin to talk about uh, revenue shortfalls, uh, think of 50 million as 5% is 10, is 10, 5 million is 10%, um, which is a significant uh, amount of, of our general fund uh, to, to, to potentially be down uh, around 10%. So let's step into a few more slides on what our mid-year shortfall is. Uh, so the council uh, and members of the public may remember that we took a mid-year shortfall of 4.2 million uh, just in the month of February. and uh, we solve the vast majority of that through a number of strategies, uh, but that mid-year shortfall, uh, about 300,000 was related to a uh, decline in sales tax for the current fiscal year, uh, not exclusively, but largely attributed to uh, uh, the closure of Sears, uh, which had a direct impact in uh, our sales tax that we would receive this year and ongoing. 
So the impact of that will be larger uh, uh, in the following fiscal year because we will have a full fiscal year. Uh, it's worth noting that we uh, continue to uh, be in close contact with the owner of that property, Saratage, and they do have a wonderful reuse plan that they are developing, uh, but that is a long game, not a short game. Uh, a motor vehicle in Luffy, uh, we were down 1.1 million. Uh, we have some good news that we will not be down that much, and so that'll uh, come up a little bit later, but uh, that's due to a number of school districts countywide uh, switching their funding status uh, to basic aid. Business license tax, uh, mid-year we were down 700,000. Uh, that is not exclusively, but largely related to the closure of the Sky Park property uh, off airport parking facility on San Mateo Avenue that closed. Uh, we are in close communications uh, and, and working with uh, the current owner of that property, as well as their local representatives. Um, and they uh, are developing a reuse plan. Um, but again, that uh, will take several years uh, potentially um, uh, to, to, to realize itself um, and to uh, potentially return itself to the revenue uh, that we were experiencing. Uh, and so that is a long game, uh, but not a short game for the reuse of that property. Uh, again, that airport uh, parking facility closed uh, due to uh, changes in their market uh, with how uh, the San Francisco airport has built a number of on airport parking facilities uh, and the advent of uh, ride sharing sort of reducing the uh, profitability and viability of that business. And then we had a $2 million uh, uh, reduction in building permit fees due to a few delayed projects that are delayed but not um, uh, not occurring, uh, and so that's a timing issue. But we had a $4.2 million uh, gap. Uh, we solved um, uh, 3.7 of that, uh, and we held back on solving about 500,000 until we had better information. Uh, but we delayed a number of capital projects, so $2.7 uh, million worth of capital projects were delayed. We delayed hiring some vacant positions. Uh, we delayed some, we reduced some operating costs. Uh, we reduced our allocation to our equipment reserve, and we used some money uh, in what can be referred to as the city's savings account, our unappropriated, unappropriated fund balance. Uh, so uh, next, I want to talk a little bit about um, what uh, the impacts uh, in the uh, current fiscal year are when we really combine three things, the mid-year shortfall, COVID-19, uh, and our uh, vehicle uh, license fee revenue adjustment, uh, which is a, a bit of a bright news in this whole um, financial portrait. Uh, and so I'll, I'll go over the high level and then our finance director will come back and give some details and then I'll, I'll step back up. So um, when we look at the revenue loss, so we have put together um, our estimate uh, for uh, what it means to the city of San Bruno with uh, looking at uh, what we're likely, uh, what we know we're experiencing, which is uh, a shelter in place uh, through uh, May 3rd. Uh, what that means um, for the rest of this fiscal year, we projected out, uh, assuming that even if there, the shelter in place is lifted, uh, there would be a significant uh, slow ramp up um, in the uh, May through June months of, of retail uh, and hotel occupancy. And so, our best projection is that we're down $3 million in revenue loss, and that's TLT, trans hotel room tax, that sales tax uh, from uh, all of our non-essential businesses being closed and some of the essential businesses being closed, um, a significant amount. Uh, we've already, uh, we're also um, uh, reduced a number of um, operating expenditures uh, due to the shelter in place, so we're not running some programs, uh, so that, that is a savings. Um, well, we uh, have a number of part-time uh, staff that would have supported those programs that are not working. Uh, in addition, uh, there are some uh, ins and outs uh, here because, uh, because we have limited our operations to only essential services that really affects um, uh, uh, things that we can do and, and, and there are some budgetary savings that we can realize. And so that's a total of 680,000. Um, but then we also uh, have a projected ex expense of 341000 uh, for our work to address uh, the direct impact of COVID-19. A large portion of that um, is uh, supplies uh, and equipment uh, and some uh, staff costs. And so uh, what that means is that uh, we uh, believe that the impact to the current year budget as a result of COVID-19 uh, is $2.6 million. Um, and so uh, there's a number of uh, components when we total everything up. And so when we, uh, the next slide up, 
sort of brings it all together. Uh, one beginning uh, with the mid-year. So we had a $4.2 million shortfall at the beginning of the mid-year. We implemented about 3.7 million of strategies, which left a half a million uh, remaining from that mid-year shortfall that we were gonna talk about uh, at our uh, third quarter uh, presentation, uh, which was due in the month of um, um, May. And so we will still have that. Um, and then when we look at, at the 2.7 million uh, that we're impacted by, uh, due to the general fund impact on COVID-19. Uh, and the, the bright spot here is that we did just yesterday receive updated information on our vehicle license fee uh, from the county. Uh, and thankfully, uh, there was an adjustment made to every city in the county. Uh, and our portion of that uh, means that we will receive $900,000 more than we're projecting. And so the good news is that uh, what was looking like a $3.2 million deficit is now a uh, $2.3 million deficit, but that's the bad news. Uh, and so we need to work to address that and develop strategies. Uh, and so uh, we are literally in the process of doing that. Tonight's presentation is really to provide the city council and the public uh, with the analysis that has been done uh, to date. Uh, and we will be back before the city council with strategies uh, very shortly. So right now I'm gonna pause and turn it over uh, back to our finance director who will go into a little bit more detail of what these impacts are. Uh, and then I will come back up to talk further. Thank you very much, Javon. And so I will just walk through in a little bit more detail um, the high level financial uh, impacts related to COVID-19 on the city of San Bruno, um, starting first with our revenues. And so as the city manager indicated, we will be experiencing um, some uh, revenue impacts in a variety of our revenue sources, primarily from sales tax, transient occupancy tax, um, and various departmental revenues. Um, at this time, we are not projecting any decrease in our property tax revenue or business license tax revenue. And I want to go into detail and explain that for this current fiscal year. But it is likely that we um, will experience some decline in those revenue sources in the coming fiscal year. So this table summarizes, um, it lists the components that make up the $3 million projected revenue reduction that staff is projecting in this current fiscal year. And as you can see, um, the greatest uh, portion of that $3 million revenue reduction comes from reduced sales tax revenue. The next largest is our transient occupancy tax. Uh, it's more commonly known as the hotel tax. And then you can see the other um, reductions coming from departmental revenues in community services, uh, building permit fee revenue, and the police department for parking fines and other reimbursements. So I'd like to step through each one of these in just a little bit of detail to explain um, the methodology and the assumptions and, project and projections that staff use to develop um, each one of these individually. So first, starting with property tax. Again, to reiterate, uh, staff is not projecting any um, reduction in our property tax revenue in the current fiscal year. Uh, the property tax uh, installment uh, for, for the second installment to the county was delayed from April 10th uh, as, the, as the initial due date to May uh, 4th. The Board of Supervisors uh, in San Mateo County authorized that um, just recently uh, without any penalties being issued in, on May 4th. Um, staff is uh, anticipating that there will be some sluggish property tax revenue and a potential decline in coming years, potentially, uh, based, on, based on some historical data in recent recessions and just less uh, new construction activity and home sales um, on prior economic indicator slides. Um, there may also be potential reassessments of, property of properties um, if the values of them have declined um, recently as well. This graph here shows the total assessed valuation of all properties in the city of San Bruno. And uh, it does show um, on average uh, an increase, um, you know, sort of annually uh, year over year. But what it does show is that in the two recent recessions, that had occurred over the past uh, 25, uh, 26 years, it does show a decline in uh, assessed valuation um, immediately following those recessions and for a few years uh, thereafter. And that's a little bit more uh, clearly depicted on this graph, which shows the annual change of the assessed values of all the properties in San Bruno. And immediately following 9-11, uh, you can see that there, that there was a recession and that property values declined just over 12% um, from the prior year 
um, when that recession hit. And then as you can see uh, with the Great Recession that occurred just about 10 years ago, that there was a leveling off that occurred with property values and that, there was actually, and that was actually followed by two years of property value decline before it started slowly and gradually rising um, a few years after that. So although the city of San Bruno is not at this time projected to um, reduce its property tax uh, revenue um, at this time, it may actually um, incur reduced property tax revenue in a few years from now, depending on the, on the, the length and the depth of the recession that, that could follow. So now I'd like to talk about sales tax. Um, this pie chart here shows the proportional share of the sales tax revenue uh, by industry um, within the city of San Bruno. And so the main takeaway on this slide is that some of the major portions of our sales tax uh, revenue come from industries that unfortunately were hit very hard from the shelter in place order. And that includes automobile and transportation sales, restaurants and hotels, and general consumer goods. Um, those sectors were hit uh, substantially during the shelter in place order. This pie chart here shows the proportional share of the sales tax revenue in the major uh, retail and high sales tax generating uh, geographic areas within the city of San Bruno. As you can see, the area that, that generates the most sales tax revenue comes from the transit corridor area, and that does include San Mateo Avenue. Uh, the next is from Tanfran, um, others scattered throughout the city limits, and then town center uh, is at 19%. And again, most of these, um, of these, high, uh, these high volume uh, retail and other sales tax generating um, operations have either closed completely um, or have some reduced, um, some reduced operation because of the shelter in place order. Again, this graph shows about the same, I just the, the main takeaway on this, on this chart uh, showing our sales tax by major industry, again, is that the industries that are hit the hardest from the shelter in place order are those industries that the city of San Bruno relies on to generate sales tax revenue. So there were uh, a few uh, state of California executive orders from the governor that impact uh, the state and municipal governments within the, within, uh, within the state to uh, realize that sales tax revenue. The, the state of California uh, enacted a deferral program of up to potentially $3 billion statewide, and that provides relief to over 300,000 businesses um, that are able to potentially defer their sales tax remittances to the state um, which then would delay the state redistributing that sales tax revenue back down to municipalities. And for the city of San Bruno, that, that, uh, that amount is about $720,000 potentially uh, in the current fiscal year. There is also another program that provides specific relief to small businesses, and it allows them to defer up to $50,000 of remitting their sales tax to the state for up to 12 months. And that, that, the impact of that on the city of San Bruno is just over $320,000. It's also anticipated that there may be some new buying habits for consumers out there. And that is sort of to be determined um, how that might impact our sales tax revenue. So overall, as I mentioned earlier, we have some areas of the city that are hit harder than others. Um, with it's potential that there will be a sort of a slow ramp up in sales tax um, activity uh, in June into uh, July into the rest of calendar year 2020. Um, and overall, the projected deficit, the projected revenue loss, as the city manager said earlier, is about $1.1 million. And at this time, the, the, uh, the projected revenue reduction into next fiscal year is just over 4%. But again, we will continue to evaluate and analyze that data to come up um, with a firm uh, sales tax revenue projection for fiscal year 2021. The next revenue uh, source that's anticipated to have a reduction in the current year is our transient occupancy tax. And the assumptions here are that there was um, very, very little um, occupancy occurring in, our, in San Bruno hotels in the second half of March. And that will continue into April and May with a gradual slow ramp up starting in June and into July. And so the net impact of the, the lack of occupancy in those hotels results in approximately $635,000 of lost TOT 
revenue for the city of San Bruno. Moving on to business license tax. Uh, at this time, the city is not anticipating any lost revenue from business license tax. That's primarily due to the annual recertification program for businesses occurring at the beginning of the fiscal year. So we recognize most of that revenue in July. Um, staff will be analyzing the potential impacts of the shelter in place order um, and any impact to businesses gross receipts that is the basis for the tax into the upcoming uh, fiscal year's budget in 2021. But again, at this time, we are, we are not projecting any lost revenue in business license tax. So now moving on to departmental revenue. First, the first department I'd like to present is our community, service, our community services department, which includes our recreation programs, the senior center, uh, the library and parks. As the city manager indicated earlier, most of our programs, not all of them in recreation, aquatics, sports, classes, senior center programs have all been um, delayed, uh, are, are postponed right now, they're not, they're not occurring. Um, and we are not able to recognize any revenue from those programs. Um, also with the reduction of revenue, we, are, we will experience some reduced costs because many of those programs are not occurring. The net projected impact on the city's budget, the net loss from all of those activities is about $72,000. Moving on to our Community and Economic Development Department, which is the department that reviews planning applications and building permits. Um, the governor's order significantly reduced the, the type and the volume of building and construction activity that is allowed to occur and really only limited to essential activities. Uh, this will result in uh, staff only being able to review essential building permits and conduct inspections um, on those as well. Uh, planning applications are still being accepted and uh, a few of um, the large development projects that are already in the pipeline, such as YouTube phase one and Mills Park are still proceeding without delays, but the net impact of the reduced permit volumes is projected to be around $326,000 um, in the current fiscal year. And then the last departmental impact comes from our police department. There are fewer community service officers that are, uh, that are not issuing um, parking tickets and other citations at this time. And we do have some reduced security services um, that the department provides as well. Uh, so there's a loss of revenue there, but that's also partially offset from some savings that the department is, ex is anticipating in reduced part-time salaries, um, reduced overtime expenses, equipment and uniforms. And so the net impact on the police department is uh, a loss of about $179,000. So now I just summarized the impacts to the city's general fund, but I'd like to take a moment to talk about uh, the new district sales tax that was actually just implemented um, on April 1st, um, more commonly known as Measure G that the voters of San Bruno uh, voted to approve back in November of 2019. So the voters uh, approved of a half cent sales tax uh, measure uh, that increased the sales tax up to 9.75%. That sales tax rate took effect uh, on April 1st, so just a few weeks ago. And it was initially projected that that revenue, um, that the revenue generated from that additional tax would generate approximately $4 million annually. And so because the, the rate took effect um, on April 1st, that, that represents about three months worth of activity, the projection was about a million dollars. Uh, that would likely come in from that revenue source. Um, as council uh, might recall, that amount was not budgeted. We did not budget that revenue source to really make sure that we understand um, the timing and the frequency of that, of that revenue coming in. And so there's no um, budget loss because of because that was actually not budgeted. But it is important to note that the revised projection for fiscal year 1920 for three months of activity has been brought down to $150,000. Um, down from a million dollars. And so that's just fewer measure G dollars that can be used um, for a variety of different services and projects. So now I'll like to shift gears from talking about revenue and now let's talk about um, expenditures. And so as the city manager indicated, there are a number of additional expenditures that the city has incurred that is directly related to the city's response efforts um, related to COVID-19. So on this, on this slide right here, it summarizes the types of expenses that have already been incurred. 
and that ranges from staff costs, uh, primarily overtime, and the paying of some of many of our part-time employees their scheduled time. Um, but then other non-salary items include the purchase of a variety of different personal protective equipment to ensure that the city's staff is safe uh, performing their jobs. We've also had to procure a number of cleaning supplies to ensure that our facilities are clean and, dis and disinfected, um, some IT equipment to ensure that we're uh, communicating effectively with the public and that our emergency operations are running efficiently and a few other expenses. So that totals just under $180,000 of expenses that have, that have been incurred to date. So with the expenses incurred to date, staff has developed a projection um, of what is anticipated to be spent for this whole, for the entire fiscal year on COVID-19 um, response efforts. And that projection is, uh, brings us to just over $340,000. Um, it's important to note here that uh, staff is working very closely uh, with state and federal agencies on ensuring that we um, do receive the maximum amount of reimbursement for the expenses that we, that we have incurred. And there's a couple uh, differences that you might notice on this slide. Uh, staff is, is accurately tracking all of our staff time of the more than 80 employees that have, that have currently dedicated time to response efforts. That time, although not paid as overtime, a majority of that time is potentially reimbursable. So we are doing our best to track all of those expenses um, to ensure that we can achieve the maximum reimbursement from um, the state and federal sources. As I said, we're working with our federal and state agencies and uh, the reimbursement process, uh, we will provide updates to city council um, over, this, over the life of this event and for the many months to come. Uh, about 75% of the expenses uh, that are deemed allowable are potentially reimbursable and uh, staff will work closely with city council um, and these uh, agencies to ensure that we move through all those processes. We will also continue to, uh, to um, explore any federal grant opportunities that may be out there to support our efforts and then also look to see if there's any insurance that we might be able to leverage for business interruption for our losses of revenues as well. And so with that, I will turn it back over to our city manager to talk about our reserve funds and then um, a preview of the budget cycle here to come. Perfect. All right, uh, thank you, Keith. Um, and so let, let's talk a little bit about reserves because in times like this, uh, that's why you have reserve funds. Um, the city has a number of uh, reserve funds. Um, First of which is what we call our fund balance. Uh, we have a policy of 1.5 million. We began this fiscal year, uh, the 1920 uh, fiscal year with that very last column on the right, a little bit over uh, 2 million in that fund. We had a general fund reserve of 12.7. We had a capital reserve of 5.3, an emergency disaster reserve fund um, of uh, $23 million. Um, uh, on, on the books. Um, the, the story as the city council knows uh, in raw cash uh, is a lot different. Um, and that is a part of our reality that uh, we have to take a hard, a hard swallow uh, and realize. Uh, and so uh, our total general fund reserve as shown on the prior slide and, and at the top of this slide is 23.5 million. However, uh, since about 2008, uh, the, city, the city's um, um, City Net Services Department, uh, now titled, uh, or currently titled City Net Services, uh, uh, previously titled the Cable Fund, um, has utilized the city's reserve uh, to cover their annual deficits and capital expenditures. Uh, and so in, in, in real dollars, uh, just under 16 million or 15.7 million uh, has been spent. And so the cash balance in our general fund reserve fund right now is 7.7 .7 million. Um, and I'll pause there because we had a little hiccup uh, that I wanna apologize uh, publicly to the council and to the community about uh, with regard to city net services over um, uh, really uh, beginning April 1. Um, but uh, the public and our members uh, of the public that uh, utilize city net services uh, saw a pre-planned rate increase uh, that took effect April 1st. Uh, and many of them have been wondering why was this rate increase uh, instituted? Uh, and the answer is on the screen before you. It's because the department 
um, over the last um, uh, more than 10 years uh, has used since 2008 um, has not uh, covered its cost and it's an enterprise fund uh, and, and we have been subsidizing uh, the rates uh, and so uh, the last time the rates were um, increased was 2007. We developed a plan over a number of months to increase rates um, and then communicated that, uh, but the hard truth of that uh, is that the communication was not sufficient. There was a notice on the March bill, there was a notice uh, um, uh, on, put on the website, and there was a notice on the April bill, and, and all were insufficient, and a number of uh, members of our community saw that rate increase uh, without prior warning, and so I want to apologize for that. Um, but we have um, taken steps to write that enterprise. As the city council knows, we developed a business plan uh, that really hinges on uh, the fiber to the home project, uh, but also hinges on um, the first thing you do when you find yourself in a hole is stop digging. And so we've done a number of things, including renegotiating contracts, uh, being uh, making channel selection um, changes to make sure that that, that enterprise um, uh, can cover its costs uh, because we cannot continue to let the enterprise use the city's reserve fund to cover its annual deficits. And in times like this, uh, we need that cash uh, to, to protect the community. Uh, and so we did develop a plan uh, before COVID-19, um, but unfortunately that was not uh, well communicated and we are uh, rectifying that um, as we speak. Uh, staff is working to uh, develop new communication tools uh, and working on um, some of the some customers that uh, did receive uh, a, a number of stacked rate increases because they participate uh, or subscribe to a number of premium packages. We're going to cap uh, those on the higher level plans uh, to a maximum increase of $25. Um, and so that will be an, uh, formally announced and, and rolled out. Uh, but but we, we're running an enterprise that uh, provides um, uh, cable um, inter entertainment and also access to the internet. Um, and uh, we're, uh, we uh, have, a, have a long term strategy to write that. Uh, and unfortunately, um, the rate increases uh, uh, hit uh, right as uh, the community was going through COVID 19. Uh, so, our total reserve when we um, account for that uh, cable or city net services deficit uh, that is currently alone. Um, and we uh, include our other funds is $11.8 million. And so that is the cash on hand that we have to address the uh, current economic downturn. Um, I think likely we're all gonna look back in, in March and realize we were already in a recession, but no one's calling it officially a recession, so I should not. Um, and so what are our budget strategies and next steps? Uh, they're being formulated. Uh, and so the strategies we're looking at um, are, are listed. I'll go through a few of them. What I want to say is, is over the last um, uh, four or five days, uh, I've had uh, video calls with uh, all of our departments uh, where all of our employees were on. And um, the reality is the economic uh, impact to San Bruno is going to mean that we're, our organization uh, may look a little different. The services we provide to the community may look a little different. Uh, we've done a lot of analysis uh, like other cities have. And so everyone is stepping into this slowly. Uh, frankly, we'll know more in two weeks than we know uh, today. Uh, we really need to know uh, when the economy uh, restarts. We know enough now to know that uh, in the current fiscal year, uh, we're looking at significant revenue loss, uh, and we are uh, prepared for that. Uh, and um, with the analysis that is being provided to the council and the community, um, what comes after that is our strategies. And so potentially service level reductions, uh, potentially uh, deferring additional capital projects, um, looking at shared staff resources, uh, holding vacant positions. Uh, the organization knows that um, uh, we, while we have some vacant positions now, um, um, uh, those are being reviewed with ex extreme scrutiny and uh, we will likely not move forward uh, with a number of those. Um, we are identifying uh, ways to utilize our reserve funds, uh, knowing that uh, Given uh, their, their levels, we cannot uh, rely on them exclusively, uh, but utilizing a portion of those, uh, potentially utilizing some of the Measure G revenue, even though that has gone down from a million dollars uh, projected this fiscal year to $150,000. Uh, we will also uh, um, uh, likely uh, start formally talking to our bargaining groups uh, and look at some other uh, strategies uh, that we um, this list may very well get longer. So uh, our projection, uh, we're, we're refining uh, the projections. Um, 
uh, we will uh, come to the city council with a third quarter update on May 12th. Uh, we may also return uh, sooner than that uh, as more information is developed and strategies um, uh, become a little clearer. Uh, and we um, uh, will absolutely need to seek city council approval uh, for a number of them, changes to our uh, expenditures, use of the reserve, use of um, both the regular and the emergency reserve, uh, Measure G, uh, and any uh, other things that uh, may be on the list. And so budget prep, um, before we go there, we wanted to talk about our comprehensive fiscal sustainability project. And so while uh, some members of the public may be tuning in um, to this presentation, uh, and without the benefit of some of our prior budget conversations, uh, we have uh, an existing comprehensive fiscal sustainability project that we launched um, in November uh, 2018, really as a, a minimum of a 24 month project to rest, uh, restore our fiscal health. Uh, frankly, that is under revision now uh, because of uh, the impact of uh, COVID-19. And so we're analyzing uh, the current and uh, immediately projectable economic impacts, and we're going to adjust this year's budget as well as next. Um, and we've, we've taken a number of steps, and I think the city council and the community should be proud of the organization for everything that has been done um, to um, uh, get us to this point now. Uh, but we have to um, adjust on the fly, uh, retool the project, uh, and deal with what has uh, been placed before us. Uh, and so, um, Many of this, a little bit of this has been uh, touched on, but um, by the finance director, Measure G, that took effect on April. Uh, uh, we have a fee study project uh, that um, uh, the study session for that has been delayed, but we'll come back to the city council. Um, and then we are uh, also, as a community and the council knows, exploring additional revenue sources. Uh, we had prior direction from the city council to look into uh, a potential increase in our hotel room tax, also called the transient occupancy tax. Uh, and from our budget conversations uh, uh, last fiscal year, we know that our stormwater fund uh, has some significant funding challenge and we've been looking at ways to prop that up. Uh, this is our budget calendar. Uh, we launched internally with our city departments uh, on May 21st. Um, this is sort of truncated, a lot of work happened in uh, February and March. Uh, but right now uh, we are scheduling our city council priorities and uh, strategic initiatives um, meeting that was planned for March, but uh, was delayed due to our response to COVID-19. And so I think uh, based on the responses, we're looking at next Tuesday, April 21st, not the 24th. Uh, and then we have a number of um, conversations and meetings uh, in April, uh, uh, later, late April, May and June. Uh, in order as we step toward the city council's adoption of the budget in time for July 1 of next fiscal year. Uh, challenges, as we all know, sort of lingering and sluggish uh, economic recovery, um, and it'll likely require uh, a number of things that we've talked about. Uh, next steps, uh, we're gonna continue to collaborate uh, with our county officials as we all respond to COVID-19 and uh, the long-term uh, recovery plan uh, I'm sorry, the long-term plan to, uh, to step out of the shelter in place uh, is actively uh, being put together uh, and a number of people here at the city of San Bruno are working on that uh, and thinking locally. Uh, we'll continue to modify uh, what's called our COOP, our continu continuity of operation, uh, uh, continue to develop our contingency of operations plan um, for public safety and our other city departments. Uh, we'll continue to monitor and assess programming. Uh, I think the public knows that at this point, uh, recreation programs, um, uh, senior programs and library programs are not occurring. Uh, and we're making those decisions about programs that will occur in the summer months um, uh, as we need to, uh, as more information uh, becomes available. And so we're, we're not announcing any uh, major changes right now uh, to what's planned in the summer, but we know enough to know that they will not likely look like they did uh, in prior summers. Um, and so that's that's it. Uh, that is the closure of our presentation. I guess 101 slides. Uh, so thank you. That doesn't include uh, Roseanne Frouse's uh, few slides. Um, but council, that's all we have uh, as far as the formal presentation. Uh, Keith and I are here um, and ready to take any questions you may have. Thank you. Uh, thank you both uh, to the manager and to um <clears throat> the finance director and so let's bring it uh to council
Also, I want to give an opportunity for anybody in the public who also may want to have input too. Um, with it a little after nine, what, why don't we go ahead and start with Marty? And if anybody from the community wishes to, if you could start to, to raise your hand, and then we can maybe bring you in after in case you need to uh, depart. So, Marty. Yes, thank you. Um, and thank you for that um, 101 page uh, slide deck. It's a lot of a lot of information. Um, it's a lot of, um, it, this is, this is incredible amount of effort and it's going to be hard to get through, but I'm sure we're going to do it. Um, so I have a couple comments and um, suggestions. Uh, the first comment is regarding uh, COVID-19 testing. Um, I, along with the mayor and, and our other council members are on these uh, countywide uh, calls. They're, they're at three times a week and we repeatedly hear that um, we need more testing. Well, San Bruno doesn't test. That's the county is taking the lead on that. And it's gotten to a point where because of lack of personnel, lack of PPE, lack of test kits that it's not moving as fast as we all would like it to across the county and across the state to the point where the, the governor is, is trying to figure it out as well. So I wanted to address that because um, so many so many people are talking about the need for testing. Um, my, my question uh, now is regarding the homeless. If we are going to allow them to shelter in place should we not be providing porta potties, hand washing stations, um, maybe even some dumpsters, so that it doesn't get out of hand, and that at the very least, um, those that are in that condition, they can help protect themselves by washing their hands and, and going uh, to the restroom in, in a porta potty instead of, you know, around the corner on a bush. Um, um, Mr. Mayor, do you want me to continue on? I have two more, uh, or, or should we wait for the answers? Or No, go ahead, Martin. I okay. That's good. And so, because whatever the answer comes back, some of us may want to piggyback on some of the things. Got it. Got it. Great, great. Um, the, uh, the other thing is, is we're um, either myself and, and on social media, we're seeing people that are not practicing safe uh, social distancing. So what is the appropriate thing that somebody should do if they go by and see a bunch of kids playing um, at a ball field. Um, I saw it the other day where the kids, like kids do, you jump a fence if it's locked, right? Um, so is there a number? Is it the police uh, dispatch? It's definitely not 911. Um, what additional efforts are we doing to try to help uh, advise our residents of that and to actually enforce it? Um, and then um, my my uh, recommendation regarding uh, getting the information to our business owners is if we could put together a video, um, the, the video that uh, have the production of the videos that have been going out are excellent um, and it's something that we could refer people to a YouTube channel that has that information so that um, all that could be repeated and stop and record or stop and replayed for people to understand better and also to have it in other languages that you could just have a, it, the, the information dubbed um, on top of that. So those are uh, my comments. Thank you very much for uh, that presentation. It was, it was a lot to take and um, this is, this is a little overwhelming, but uh, I'm sure we're going to get through it. So thank you. Sure. Yvonne? Sure. Um, yeah, we are in unprecedented times. I think to step uh, through your questions, uh, as far as the suggestions on, on ways to uh, provide additional information to the community and the business community, um, uh, our PIL team, uh, I know, is, is watching and has noted that, and, 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 and we'll take that back. Um, in regard to uh, enforcement, uh, enforcement is, is, is a tough thing, right? Uh, to enforce means to uh, bring people in close contact uh, uh, with 
uh, another person or many other people and uh, what we are trying to do and everything that we are doing is to disassociate ourselves and not to put our employees at, at risk uh, to um, provide enforcement. Uh, I, I think if we want to step back globally, um, everything we are doing is on education and voluntary enforcement um, or voluntary compliance. And I think um, countywide, citywide, uh, people are, are remarkably complying uh, for their own safety and for the safety of other individuals. Uh, I think that we have uh, a number of unique instances, uh, businesses that uh, were operating and um, uh, specific contact was, was made to them uh, and to educate them on the order. Um, we do not have the resources uh, for people to call 911 every time they see a group of kids um, at the park. I think our best resource to have conformance is for um, everyone to take responsibility for themselves and their families um, and everyone um, to articulate that to uh, people they love. I, I think nationally we have seen uh, that sometimes younger people are not um, believing the statistics. And so we have to do everything we can to continue to communicate that. Um, and when our officers that are out see people, uh, they do remind them of the order. Uh, but to, to tell the public uh, to call 911 when you see people um, gathering together, we don't know if they're in the same household. Uh, and so we've had a number of, of calls like that, uh, frankly, already, where um, people see a number of people walking together at the park. Uh, and so we don't want to encourage people to call 911 when they see a, a group of people together because they very well may be in the same household. I think we have to continue to re remind people that we're doing this for our, our own safety uh, and the safety of others. Uh, and we know that people are dying and people are as asymptomatic. And that's a reality. Um, in regard to, to homeless and sheltering in, in place, I should probably clarify that um, we are, are not going to uh, simply allow homeless encampments um, to be and have the uh, negative um, quality of life impacts. Um, we have stepped up our cleaning of them and we uh, will address any issues of criminality um, and if anything uh, gets to the point where there needs to be um, a forced eviction. Um, however, um, the CDC guidance and the guidance from the county is to not move people because it's not in the interest of public health. Uh, and so we are complying with that uh, like other jurisdictions uh, within our county uh, and across the Bay Area. Uh, and, and yeah, and, and other parts of the country because the CDC is a federal um, organization and they do have guidance to all municipalities. Uh, in regards to providing um, additional support to homeless encampments, all of those items that you mentioned are being looked into. Uh, there are triggers for doing that that comes with the financial cost, uh, but we are we are looking at all of that. Just just one one more uh, thing, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, I do want to thank our city manager for acknowledging uh, the city net services um, information. I, I think that's really important to, to that. Um, it's just, it's a fresh, uh, it's a fresh air to be able to to take uh, responsibility, and and we're going to fix that. So, um, I, I wanted to thank you for that. That's it. Thank you, Marty and Melissa. Do we have anybody so far? Just not know. Okay. Uh, just um, want to follow up. Just something on if it's okay, then because I don't see any of their hands up right this second. Then we'll go to Laura. Um, is on the testing that is something that was you know has been brought up like you said and i had reached out to jackie spears office uh last week just to check into other elements because somebody said you know hayward uh, does have a facility it's ran through the county just like ours has ran through the county or with the fairgrounds it is free but you are still screened so you have to have the temperature you have to answer the questions you have to be in a risk category um I can tell you that Dr. Charity Dean is now the chair of a task force on testing that the governor established last weekend. Uh, it's supposed to be addressing the issues in the supply chain, finding solutions for testing shortfalls, looking to identify more assessment collection sites and analyzing new laboratory science that is becoming available, ramping up testing by a five times uh, more capacity. Um, that is something that also is the challenge when I talked to the county manager Monday before the county uh, meeting that Marty re referenced, uh, it was again on the homeless and testing. But again, it is um, about the kits, uh, some of the things that Marty alluded to. It's also about the criteria. 
is very stringent. It's very strict about who gets to get tested. So what, they're, what uh, the congresswoman has been doing, the county has been pushing with the governor's office, which is, they're now examining it, is how do we broaden that? So how do we have people who uh, take care of individuals? How do we have people who uh, are in our grocery store personnel? That they're allowed to have that same mechanism as a public safety personnel. So it is to broaden that horizon so that we can do it because the fairgrounds in San Mateo are being underutilized. It's been acknowledged at the county meetings, been acknowledged, and so we need to vamp that up. But it's also a matter of um, us trying to be collaborative. I've speaking, spoken excuse me, to the South City Mayor and the Daily City Mayor this weekend, and they don't have sites, nor do they plan to, for the same elements uh, that the county has told us on the county meetings. So I just wanted to touch base since that was fresh in my head on the, on just the testing, and then I'll, I'll let uh, uh, Laura, uh, you're next. Mayor Medina, I did want to clarify, oh, we do right. have one member of the public with their hand raised, but um, we also have Council Member Davis, um, Vice Mayor Salazar, and Council Member Mason's hand up, too. Uh, you're unmuted now. What would you prefer, Laura? Do you want to go? Um, or... I, I was going to just comment. I do have some comments, but I would really like to hear from the public first. Okay. Melissa, if you don't mind, uh, uh, colleagues, if you don't mind, it's one person will get, allow them, please. Sure. Um, it's... It's either Steven Seymour or Sandra Perez. I will allow them to talk and unmute them. Okay, Th this is Steven hey. Seymour. Um, Hello. <laughs> yeah, hi. Hi. Um, so I, I just wanted to um, follow up on, uh, are you guys, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, good. Because I just got a weird screen. Um, but I just want to follow up on um, what Marty brought up. Uh, while uh, the guidance is not to move homeless camps, what Marty mentioned was, are there facilities or like uh, the ability to put uh, a hand wash uh, or, or, or porta potty or something where these uh, homeless camps are so that we can uh, reduce the risk to the general public and also to the people that are in the homeless camps. I can understand if they have said they don't want to seek uh, a room in one of these hotels that we have, but uh, over near uh, 380, right off of El Camino, there's at least four or five people there, and they have a tent that probably took several days to erect. Um, I'm sure that the people who live nearby uh, have concerns. So that's something that uh, uh, um, City Manager uh, Jovan did not re respond to when Marty asked that. I would be interested in his response to that. And then also, I'd like to mention, um, we've been walking our uh, in our neighborhood just to get some exercise. And one thing I have noticed is um, there are many, many, many more people that are blocking the sidewalks and even parked on the sidewalks. And you can look right to the street and see that there are either spaces to block the driveways so that they're not blocking the sidewalks or to actually park on the street. Um, yet people have decided not to use that now. And I think it's because they know that they're not going to be cited. So I, I realize that this, the, the city's taken a stance that they don't want to cite people because people may have lost their income. But on the other hand, we have people, I believe, who are abusing the system right now. And it's making it difficult for those of us who are walking this past weekend. And we sent a video to you all. Um, we, My wife and I witnessed a lady with a stroller who had to walk into the street with two children in the stroller because there was somebody and uh, Mayor Medina, thank you very much for going out there. It's been cleared up. But I do think that that's something that our police department could probably uh, be facilitate doing a better job of facilitating because I believe that people are taking advantage of it right now. Thank you very much. I appreciate the time. Thank you for your comments. Um, Laura, you are up next. Thank you. So I'm, I'm glad that uh, city manager uh, clarified the question on the homelessness. And um, to Stephen Seymour, I had the exact same comment and question and follow up that I have as well. Um, I actually looked at the CDC website and it refers to that if they're not able to find housing for them, um, which I hope that we can get them into a hotel of some sort, but that we're not to move them um, for the potential uh, increase in the infectious disease being spread. And like he says, so then what are we doing to provide them? I mean, let's be, let's, I think the bottom line is 
anybody who's on this call today or listening from home and you have a homeless encampment that gets set up across the street from where you live and you've got kids out playing or whatever, you don't want it. And so I feel the, the pain that any resident in San Bruno would feel that we're, the message we're hearing is if they set up a homeless encampment, we can't do anything about it. We can't move them. So I'd like to make sure we try to get them moved as soon as possible, because if they're not there now, we shouldn't allow them to come. And if, and if we can't find them a place or not interested in life moves, we work with the county to try to get them a hotel room. Um, and if not, we try to set up the appropriate um, uh, porta potties, et cetera, so we can keep them uh, contained and sheltered in that location. Um, Cause I do worry. Um, my next comment would be to Jovan and Keith as well, our city uh, finance director, uh, excellent presentation. It was a lot of information, um, but if you didn't get the gist of that, that things are changing and they're not going, they're not, they're going down a path of um, actually very scary times. Um, I see what we already pay. Um, I think Keith mentioned $10 million to CalPERS. And when they don't receive a 7% return on investment and that number becomes a negative number, we'll be paying an increase in CalPERS for years to come. Um, and we will be, the city will be struggling to balance our budget year after year after year. Um, so unfortunately, I know as rest of the council members, we will start to see some serious cuts, um, furloughs, which are already happening, um, cutbacks to times back prior to 2008. Um, it, it is not, it's not moving in a good direction. Um, my other, my other uh, comment is that I want to remind residents that we still can find, and, you know, I know that we have this soft approach that basically says we're notifying them, we're letting them know, we're moving them along, but people are getting fined. Um, there's been a lot of commentary in the last few days about people out of the county going into an area, oh, I'm going grocery shopping, but I live in this county, are getting fined up to $1,000. Um, we know about the college kids at Santa Cruz that were fined in Santa Cruz for attending, go ahead and out to the beach. So, you know, San Mateo County, along with the other six counties, did institute a, that you can find. Um, I hope that our own residents and people coming into San Bruno can, you know, be responsible citizens and not gather and move on and only come in for essential needs. Um, I, I, I really hope to push because that is something that, that keeps all of us safe and healthy. Um, and then my final comment is, um, how do we balance a budget going forward? And I guess I just want to leave it at that, that um, we need to think differently. We need to think about ways we are doing things and figure out um, how we can cut back, how we could, um, you know, offer services we were offering before, before that maybe are no longer essential. Um, how do we live within our means? Um, and I want to also thank uh, city manager for commenting on the city net services. Um, my phone was blown up this week. Uh, it, it's, it was un, un, um, very frustrating to hear them um, share their, their concerns and frustrations. And so um, we've got to do better. Thank you. Anything, city manager? I'll move on to Mr. Salazar. Um, a, lo a lot of a lot of comments. Um, so, Laura, Laura, thank you. Um, but yeah, this is a the, the budgetary challenge that we're facing is, is significant, uh, and we will um, continue uh, to develop solutions to implement them. I think uh, one of the the realities that we're facing is that. Uh, we went into this economic downturn, not as healthy as some other cities, uh, because we have not had a lot of economic development over the last 20 years. Uh, and so uh, we are touching base uh, with a number of developers and owners of properties in town. Uh, and uh, the good news is that the reception that we received is positive and, and people still view San Bruno uh, even in a downturn that may last uh, um, uh, several months or as somewhere where they where they want to do business and so our planning staff may be at home but they're busy working um, but if it gets any any worse I think we're going to have to accept the fact that um, we missed the development window and shift our focus to 
making sure that we can uh, be the first city out of the gate because uh, we can't tax our way out of this problem. We have to grow ourselves out of this problem. Uh, and cuts to the budget will be hard. Um, I, I think the city council and those that have watched our budget presentations over the year, so, or people that are around the city and know the, the, the level um, of building maintenance we've, we've been able to do with the, with the depressed resources. It's a, challenge, uh, it's a challenge and the cuts will be real. Um, in regard to uh, cable net services, absolutely. Um, uh, the communication on that uh, was, was not uh, sufficient uh, by any stretch. Uh, and uh, I know that the police department, uh, back to enforcement, is in conversations with the county uh, that, that did say um, uh, that citations was not the way that we wanted to go in this county. Um, uh, by and large, though, uh, people are, comp are complying, uh, and we need to continue with the positive um, messaging uh, for people to do that. Mr. Zalza. Thank you. So uh, first of all, I wanted to thank staff for that report. That, that was a very detailed and uh, well thought out report. And I also appreciate the, the candid nature of, of the news and for not sugarcoating any of this. And it's definitely uh, a lot of sobering and uh, you know, not necessarily positive news in there. Um, Fortunately, I think that th this is something that um, that will be probably more short-lived than um, the, the last uh, you know, um, economic hiccup we saw in, in past years. So I am hopeful that we're going to get past this um, quickly and, um, you know, want to make sure that we stay focused on, on the long term and that we not... Um, overreact, uh, make too many drastic decisions up front and really start thinking about this in, in, in a broader context. Um, most of the news look like uh, Northern California is faring a little bit better than, than Southern California. And, uh, layoffs are down. Um, what, one question I did have um, in, on the financial portion of it, um, we said that we don't expect um, any significant changes in the property tax for this year. And there's still a payment left, it's been deferred. Uh, but given the large number of layoffs that, that are, are being seen and the potential for um, people not making those payments, isn't there some potential that we might see a significant impact in that, uh, in that tax revenue? Uh, so, uh, no, the good news is that uh, the county has said that even though remittance to them will be delayed, uh, they will uh, remit the uh, portions that are due to the cities. Uh, and we're on what's called a teeter plan, which is that uh, if someone, for example, does not pay their uh, property tax bill, the county still pays us and the county has uh, the responsibility to go after the collection of that. And so we are made whole um, and, and the, the county uh, bears the cost uh, and essentially uh, has the float uh, until they can have a, the, the recovery through whatever mechanism is needed. Uh, and so what's true this year is that we will be made whole based on our assessed role. Uh, uh, as the finance director mentioned, uh, in the long run, and we saw that in um, uh, all the economic downturns before, there's likely a decrease in assessed value, uh, which has a decrease in tax remittances, thus a decrease in our revenue. Okay. Understood. And then, in terms of um, of savings and projected savings, um, was there any consideration given to um, reduced uh, utility costs uh, with uh, certain facilities being um, closed and uh, fuel costs with uh, you know part of our fleet being idle? Is, was that factored into the analysis? Absolutely. Finance director is nodding. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. All right. Great. Um, and then also, I, I definitely support, you know, moving forward on our uh, transit occupancy tax uh, that we had been moving toward anyway. I think uh, when we come out of this, there's going to be a lot of pent up demand uh, and it, it'll probably trickle in, but we want to be well positioned to take advantage of that when, when we do start seeing that recovery. Uh, I wanted to also ask about the short term rentals, which I know is something else we kind of had in the queue. And I was wondering if that's something that we're going to be able to move forward uh, with. Uh, in the next few months? So absolutely, still in queue, uh, honestly delayed uh, because staff has uh, been busy working on 
uh, addressing COVID-19 and, and, and other items, but uh, not lost. Uh, and I don't have a timing for when that will be back before the city council, but uh, still very much a um, extending the transient occupancy tax to short-term rentals is something that we uh, are working on and committed to do. All right. Okay. Thank you. Linda. Hi, thank you. Thanks for that um, that presentation. I just want have a, have a couple questions. I can I don't know if you prefer me to ask and then wait for an answer because they're each different. Um, the first one is um, the information provided around the homeless is really helpful. I don't think a lot of residents really understand uh, what's what the process is because prior to COVID nineteen, the law had also changed around encampments. And so that legal challenge or obstacle, I should say, mixed with COVID-19, I think is just a kind of unfettered territory. And so my request is if the city can put together an FAQs that we can post on the website and then we can share on our social media sites so that people understand um, how the city is addressing homelessness and why we are addressing it in this fashion. Absolutely, um, uh, we, we will work on that. Um, it's also sort of worth noting that uh, there's a point in time count that's done every two years. Uh, and so the last point in time count, which is a nightly count of homeless individuals in San Bruno, uh, there were 12 homeless individuals in San Bruno on that night. And while that number fluctuates, uh, it's not really off from what we see on a day-to-day -day basis and what uh, Life Moves, our homeless outreach coordinator sees. Um, and so the community should know significant outreach has occurred um, I can, I've been to just about every encampment um, and I know that our staff and our outreach staff know the individuals in, in, in those encampments. And so while the number does fluctuate, um, we have not seen a market increase in homelessness, uh, but what we have seen are some of the encampments uh, get a little bit worse um, and a number of residents that, that are sort of out walking, a ton of people are out walking and they're seeing it uh, a lot more prevalently. And, and so we are getting those calls and uh, we'll work on uh, information to communicate uh, how we address um, homelessness, because you're right, the public doesn't always know all the work that goes into that. And, and also that we don't, I mean, these encamp encampments, if it's 12 people and, you know, we say we're working on it and there's a time frame, then we at least have an idea, but we don't have an idea of how long this COVID-19 shelter in place is going to last. And so they could be there for longer than we would normally expect. So I just want to make sure we have something to point the public to. Absolutely, and what the public should also know and will communicate is that um, when even when there was a removal of an encampment, that doesn't mean that the person accepted the services right. and left San Bruno. They may have very well moved uh, two blocks away. Right. Uh, and uh, I think some of the sort of requests that we get, uh, we know that we can't legally do what people are asking, uh, but people are frustrated and, and we totally get that. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and then the next, um, the next question is around the citations. So um, there, I mean, this issue with parking has been longstanding from, from what I understand of it, even before I was on the council. Um, this is the first week I've, I've received two complaints now for parking, not on the east side. Normally it's the east side that I get complaints about. So it does appear to be, um, I guess, growing, um, just the concern around, you know, people parking illegally. Um, someone recently posted on some of the social media sites a live um, walk down San Bruno on a manual wheelchair, which looked painful to be, uh, to say the least, going up and down some of these sidewalks. And so I guess my question is, I, I fully 100% understand that the city wants to be empathetic to people who are home, possibly lost their jobs, and you know now you have a ticket on your car. I also understand that we don't want to expose our police officers um, to potential, you know, any exposure to COVID-19. So I'm wondering if we can somehow meet in the middle and maybe uh, in the meantime, while we're in this COVID-19 emergency, cut the citations in half as far as the cost goes. So go back to starting to cite. Um, at half the cost so that we're empathetic to people who may be home, uh, may be not working. Um, and then um, I don't see where there would be exposure if the citation is just being placed directly on the car. Based on the daily logs that I'm seeing, there appear to be maybe one to five incidents a day um, with, the, SF, with the, um, the police department. And so I'm just wondering if that is possible. It seems like we are fully staffed. 
um, and it might be a good way to just kind of um, defer any any more potential risk to people who really are, are having a hard time getting around these cars. Sure. Um, I think as we enter this new normal and uh, maybe here for a while, uh, we will certainly uh, reassess um, the services that the city provides and what um, uh, we do vis-a-vis -vis parking enforcement. You're, you're right, one of the immediate steps we took uh, to stop issuing parking citations uh, because um, while you're right, there are instances where a car is blocking a sidewalk, uh, but by and large, uh, issuing a parking citation um, is not a essential service uh, to sort of override the risk to public health uh, and the risk to our staff. Uh, and so um, as we sort of um, live with this, uh, we, I totally get what you're saying and, and, and we'll go back and, and take a look. The other thing I want to say is while we um, are, we're not fully staffed on our officers, but we are, uh, we, we do have a few vacancies, but our parking enforcement officers, uh, be it our community service officers, there are significant vacancies there. Uh, and we are looking into how we retool parking enforcement uh, on a more holistic basis. Uh, and to, to, we've heard, to have our officers um, sort of wholesale uh, start issuing parking tickets uh, is a challenge. One, because we have a number of officers at home on reserve status, uh, just uh, to make sure that if uh, we have an infection uh, on the force, uh, we've seen um, locally, regionally, where uh, you have dozens and dozens of uh, people in public safety that go out uh, due to one potential exposure. Uh, and our law enforcement, uh, like our firefighters, their job requires them to come into close contact uh, with individuals of the public uh, and particularly for police, they cannot wear a respirator all day uh, for all of their interactions. And so uh, they may very well come in contact with someone that is an asymptomatic carrier uh, and they know the risk of that. And so we took an immediate action to put a number of them at home, but also take a number of steps to reduce um, their interaction with the public. Uh, and that is true not only for our city, that's true regionally and statewide, uh, and that's also true for um, the type of arrests that are being made uh, and the type of arrests that are being prosecuted uh, because the courts are closed. We are in unprecedented times, uh, but I cannot say that the answer to our parking issues are enforcement and we should bring our officers back and start having them writing tickets. Uh, I think the reality in San Bruno is that the built environment is not sufficient for the amount of cars that people own. And right now we have a lot of people home. And so we do have parking challenges. We do have people parking in front of their driveways. Um, but I don't know that the answer to that is issue everyone's citations. Uh, I think we, we, we need to step up our communication around the issues. Um, I think we need to um, address the issues where sidewalks are blocked uh, when we can and when we have the resources. But we also have to be extremely cognizant to not put our employees uh, in danger because if we have a significant portion of our force that go out, we may not have the resources to, to protect this community and we may be relying on the county and other agencies to police this community. And, and we've seen that happen across the country uh, uh, where there are significant exposures and we're a small city and small cities have a unique challenge uh, given the public health crisis that we're in. Uh, and so there are no easy answers and there are no easy problems. Um, but I, I certainly uh, understand uh, the frustrations uh, that are out there and uh, where we are with parking and uh, we'll continue to work with the police department on uh, creative ways to address that. Is so is um, who the parking citations? Um, what are the the um, who would normally cite? What is the actual job description? What's the classification? Uh, two people: uh, a police officer or a community service officer. Okay, and uh, the um, parking citation. And the community service officers. Can you tell me a little bit more about what they're doing right now? Uh, sure. Um, so community service officers uh, uh, do a number of uh, things. Um, one, uh, they support uh, deconning of uh, police vehicles. Uh, so that has been stepped up. Uh, they respond out to all traffic incidents and do traffic control. Um, they help to restock supplies in police cars. Uh, they also help to uh, support on a normal day special events uh, parking enforcement, uh, they do street sweeping enforcement. Um, they, they sort of have a whole host of duties. Um, in reality, they're sort of a multi-tool that we rely on. I believe we have a total of five people, uh, three of which are part-time, two are full-time, 
And I think at this point, we only have one or two of the full-time positions full uh, filled. Uh, but, it, but their only duty is not parking enforcement, uh, which is one of the reasons why uh, the new police chief has um, uh, a task to take a holistic look at how we do parking enforcement and see if there are other ways. And I know at uh, prior council meetings, um, we've had people talk about um, other ways that other cities locally are doing parking enforcement. Uh, and we're looking into those. Uh, and I, I agree that sort of changing uh, how we do parking enforcement is needed. Uh, and parking is a significant issue in San Bruno. Um, COVID-19 or not, um, our challenge is the built environment and, and the number of cars that people own. And, and frankly, with the economics of the region, we often have more people living in the houses that they were built for. And, and we, have, um, we, we, we have parking challenges, um, uh, no two ways about it. Uh, and they're greater now that more people are at home. Okay, and then um, yeah, and I just don't I don't want to let let it completely go. I would I would still ask um, that you look at and you explore the possibility of maybe um, opening up citations again um, at you know half the cost, just so that there is some some kind some things where people are saying I have to pay attention, right? Like as opposed to um, not because what's the repercussion? Um, and then if there's a communication that goes out allowing people to park in their driveway. Um, as opposed to blocking the sidewalk, um, and I, you know, I'm definitely empathetic to our police force. I, I wouldn't, I would hate for anybody to get sick. Um, I just also want to make sure that we are balancing the needs of residents who live in these pre-World War II homes that are, you know, very many of them are tiny, and if you have a wheelchair, you want to get out and get some fresh air, um, and that we're also being cognizant of their safety as well. Absolutely. Okay. Um, the next question I had, just echoing what um, what Councilmember Salazar said, is I, I also support continuing to move forward with the short-term rentals. So I'll, I'll be waiting for that. Um, and then uh, my last question is in regards to the testing. Um, I did want to say I, I made a call. Um, actually earlier today we do have a test center and i'm going to be really cautious of how i how i guess this is phrased and you could jump in uh, city manager grogan um, but we do have a test center here in san bruno that's dignity health and um this is not uh, i guess if i can say a county sanctioned um, testing center it's not free but for members of the public who may be watching this um, it is for a, a virtual test where you actually speak with someone and then you go in to actually get um, tested in your car, um, it's about $200, $190 to be exact. And if you go in in person uh, for a checkup and a check-in, it's about $400. So it is quite pricey. Um, and a list of the insurances that they accept are available on their website. Um, but I do just want to let the public know that this is Dignity Health. It's located right next to Lucky's. Um, and they do do COVID-19 testing. I, I would love to see like all the other council members free testing. I think it's more equitable, um, but the reality is is that we have that here. And I think it's worth just mentioning that um, it is located right next to Lucky's and there is a cost associated unless your insurance covers it. Absolutely. Uh, the free testing site uh, for our county uh, is at the San Mateo County Event Center. Uh, that can be accessed through verily.com, uh, V-E-R-I-L-Y.com. There's a series of questions, uh, but that is a free test. And absolutely, Verily, uh, through their urgent care in town center, uh, has a test site, um, uh, but it is uh, costly. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to, to, to throw that out. Thank you. And um, those are all my comments. Thank you, Mayor Medina. Thanks. Thank you. And then also just to add to the testing site at the fairgrounds, the county has equipped three vans that you can go through the county. They will come and pick you up at your home. They will then bring you to the test site. They will bring you back after you've been tested. This is a service that they're trying to figure out how to step up folks that are uh, meeting the criteria to be tested. So these are three vans that are equipped and they're sealed so that the folks that are driving it are sealed from the back portion of it. Um, so these are three bands that are available. And now, um, again, you can call the county and they will uh, pick you up, bring you there and that offer of that free service. So as uh, council member uh, Mason said, it is costly over there, but that county is what is offering that there. And now there is free transportation as well. So I wanted to say that. And on the homeless too, I think we're, you know, there, I had received a call from, uh, um, 
a very nice lady who's doing some walking and she was saying that she had empathy so she didn't want to say anything about the homeless per se but could they could the garbage be picked up could more of that be kept tidy um in talking to the county manager on monday too as we know some of the colleagues that are on the call in burlingame they do have hotel rooms and they're looking to get more hotel rooms so that they can get those folks that are necessary but sheltered so they they don't interact in essence in case somebody is a carrier and unaware of it but as we all know and we've been talking about uh, they have to be willing and they have to want to um, so it is challenging um, linda talked about having some communication because if you talk about under the 380 that's the state you call the state they're not going out so everybody is kind of taking that same premise which is through the county and cdc so uh, it is challenging and i think people are seeing probably more of it and then talking to a couple of the mayors you know it is more prevalent so th that is a, a concern and then marty you brought up about the social distance and um he was mentioning about young people and i um saw two gentlemen that i'm going to say or maybe just a little older than I, uh, walking side by side, neighbors, uh, not having the appropriate distance. And I just stopped the car since I knew them and, and let them know. But even at various ages, um, I think some, some of us uh, folks are not taking it as serious as it should be. It's an inconvenience. Um, it doesn't make it easy to do what you want to do. But at the same time, um, what you bring back home could really have a, a huge effect to, to many people. So I think that's important. I do also want to say to the city manager in regards to the city net services, I appreciate uh, when you said the candor and bringing that up. Um, you know, everything can be better always. We can improve and moving forward, we, we need to. Um, I think with the challenging times that we're having, it was a very shock, big shock to the community. And we're trying to understand as to why would this community staff uh, impose that I know it had been worked on, uh, what have you, but I think it's important when these roll out, we just need to do a better job. And I think um, I wanted to mention too, on Mondays, this is the second Monday I've had it, where we have region two, uh, which were considered the coastal region within the state. And there are 14 counties that are on the line of the mayors, the managers, and the county administrators um who actually will update and again if you're asking a question it has to be on a regional basis it can't be specifically for your community uh, but in hearing some of the overall statewide information hearing from some of the other communities um one thing again that i'll always say is uh it's challenging times it's not going to get better soon uh we will get through it but to hear from the other counties that they are feeling suffering um trying to balance uh resources etc it is still you know it's very much through this country through this community through this county um and so i appreciate everybody's patience because um it has not been easy um i know that you're bringing back uh city manager next month on about the shortfall uh, options uh on what we're going to do to make sure we balance the budget which we are required to we don't have a choice but to uh, by the end of uh, June. Is there anything else, uh, city manager or finance director, you want to discuss or bring up? No, I just want to thank the city council uh, for all of your leadership uh, and thank the uh, staff. Uh, I, I've been truly amazed uh, at um, how the staff has rallied together uh, and um, adjusted uh, what we do uh, and frankly been willing to put themselves in, harm, in harm's way. Uh, uh, and we're all disaster service workers. And so I just want to say uh, from my heart, uh, thank you for everything you guys uh, are doing and uh, will continue to do to protect this community. Thank you. Thank you. There's uh, nothing else on this topic agenda. Uh, let me ask my colleagues, do you need a few minute break or do we want to move into uh, item seven? I'm good. I'd like to see us move forward. Marty, I got a nod from Marty. Yeah, nod from Marty. Sure, forward. Yes, forward. Thank you. Just wanted to make sure we were good to go. Okay.